this economy has materially slowed down. We are not in the roaring 20s. We are not in the reflation trade. What we're seeing is what you would expect. Financial conditions tightening, the economy slowing down. Most importantly, inflation is coming in a lot slower than I've been expecting. Inflation just remains too hot for them to think they're going to stop. If there was a pivot, it was that meeting to meeting guidance for viewpoint from Chair Powell. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together with Katie Lines, TK is out of the building. Futures positive, eight tenths of one percent. You like that pause, Bramow? TK is out of the building on vacation. On vacation for a long right. weekend. He might be back on Monday. What a rally we've seen in this equity market. Two days of gains post-Fed and Lisa. They've been big days of gains. They've been the biggest gains for a post-Fed meeting in history. That's according. Uh, to the data that Bloomberg collects. How do we parse this with reality? Does this sort of get uh, supported by facts or is this hopium on the heels of a lot of pessimism on thin liquidity on people unwinding shorts? And honestly, that's what I think people are parsing through. Right Did now. you see what Michael Hanna over at Bank of America said this morning? Bearish. Dove at first sight. Yeah. Dove at first sight. And he essentially says when you get to 4,200, it's a sell. It's too early to price in a Fed pivot. I was looking yesterday at the rally that we've seen in the two-year yield. The idea that yields have come in dramatically. People are basically saying that this Fed will not have to raise rates nearly as much as they did, say, three weeks ago. How does this parse with 9.1 percent inflation? How does this parse with an employment cost index coming out later today that could potentially show ongoing strength in the pace of wage gains? How do we get a sense of the Fed backing away from its uh, rate tightening policies at a time when they're not even restrictive yet? Do you want to do the recession debate now or later? Later. Save that for Washington. Yeah. You want to avoid that? You're sick well, of that already? I'm just sick of this. It's a dumb it's a dumb argument to be having. Whether we're in a recession or not a recession, a technical recession, not quite a recession. Okay, maybe it hasn't broadened out fully. The question is, are we on this trajectory into a great and gradual weakening that ends up in some sort of recession at some point in the next six to twelve months? It is not whether the NBER is gonna come out and qualify. <laughs> do you do you like this argument? I just love that I know you rehearsed this. I didn't you were even. just ready to go. No, I just you had this I don't rant like this ready debate. to go. I've got one ready to go. I'll share with you later. Amazon up by more than 11% this morning. It's absolutely flying. Katie Lines looking at the earnings out of Apple and Amazon. If you love this market yesterday, you got a green light to keep on buying it from those two names. Well, considering they both beat and they represent 10% of the S&P 500, so if they're moving higher, you can bet they're taking the broader market with them, John. What's interesting to me is, at least for Apple, the beats were by a pretty narrow margin. It isn't a quarter that they blew out of the water, so it goes to show you just how much concern there was out there about a deteriorating environment for Amazon, as much as we talk about a potential weakening in the consumer, it doesn't seem like they are seeing it yet. Their revenue guidance was very strong. And so is this performance this morning, up 12% in the pre-market. Let's whip through the price action, up 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up by more than one full percentage point. In the bond market, yields have been heading in one direction over the last month or so. South. This morning, just a little bit of a bounce, up four basis points, 271.56. Euro dollar, Lisa, we have got to talk about the data yeah. out of Europe. Record high Eurozone CPI, GDP strong elsewhere, Germany stagnating. This yeah. is getting harder and harder for this ECB. And Germany really standing out with other regions doing better than expected, Germany doing worse. And this really is the story. How much is this a natural gas story, an issue of what's going on with Russia and the Nord Stream 1 uh, pipeline? How much is that really going to determine the future of the German economy, at least in the near term? Today, it's ECI Friday. We get the employment cost index for the second quarter at 8.30 a.m. We also get other data, including personal income spending and the PCE deflator for the month of June. I'm looking at how much we see an ongoing acceleration of the pace of wage gains, especially because right now the market believes, at least according to pricing, that the Fed is going to be able to back away, call it a pivot, call it perhaps a dovish uh, move, whatever you want to call it, that is what's being priced into the market. Will this come out hot and all of a sudden will people be forced to rethink that? At 10 a.m. we get the July University of Michigan sentiment data. We've been talking about inflation expectations over the next five to 10 years that did soften recently in some of the recent uh, readings, which is possibly why people have conviction to say that the Fed could back away. How much do we see it, though, continue to weaken? How much do people see all of the headlines about recession, whether it's a technical or otherwise? How much do people see the prices that they're paying and continue to feel negative about the outlook? 
or do we see, the, see a rebound? And then how does the Fed respond to that? It's just a real messy soup of uh, data as well as understanding of what's coming ahead. And the earnings parade does continue. Oil majors Chevron and Exxon should be reporting within the next uh, minutes, really. They could report any time before the bell. And I'm curious about Colgate, Palmolive, and Procter & Gamble, the consumer staples. How much are people going into those and moving away from discretionary items? It's really been a motley picture, at least so far. The takeaway for me as we get the best monthly gain right now in the S&P if things stay on track going back to November 2020, John, is that people had priced in so much worse than we're getting that even misses are getting rewarded. People are cheering a bar that has been lowered and then a company stepping across that I think about Apple. This is not exactly an incredibly strong earnings picture. It is just traders that have priced in so much worse. And that is what we're seeing. And I think that that's going to be the theme of this earnings season. Amazon's a piece of that for sure. Yes. Up 12% in the free market. Bramo, thank you. Your day ahead. Looking out for that data at 8.30 Eastern time. Then again, a little bit later this morning. Let's get to the conversation now with Tony Crescenti, market strategist, portfolio manager and member of the investment committee over at PIMCO. Tony, great to have you with us. How morning, rare John. is it to have consecutive quarters of really strong non GDP growth and contractionary real GDP? And how on earth is the Fed meant to respond to that? Well, the Federal Reserve, like investors, should recognize that there's been a lot of ups and downs in the economy in this quite fast-moving cycle since 2020. It was only last year we were looking at uh, GDP numbers on a year-over-year -year basis in the double digits. And so we probably should be looking at it in that context. And the Federal Reserve probably is too. It is in the sense that it recognizes that the initial conditions going into this recession, if it is one, as Lisa suggests, we shouldn't obsess over whether there's a recession. We should be thinking about as investors what the depth of it might be if there is one. But the initial conditions going into this weaker year, as we could certainly call it, given the two negative GDP prints, is quite strong in lots of areas. That's, and it suggests that the economy can handle a, a strong uh, negative um, conditions, and so a, a strong storm, if you will. Well, and so it, it's likely that the economy um, fares better than many expect uh, when we are in a recession, if we can realize it when we're in it or in its aftermath. Tony, this is the reason why I don't understand the market's reaction to the recent data and to the Fed meeting. Because if the economy does have underlying resilience, which seems to be the response, at least in markets, to some of these earnings, then why are people pricing in a Fed pivot? Why are they pricing that the Fed won't go as far, won't stay there for as long, and will start cutting rates as soon as the first quarter of next year? It probably is a recency bias and reflects the experience of the 2010s and this idea that the Federal Reserve uh, and other central banks can't go very far with their policy rate. We, we agree with the idea of, this, of a new neutral, the view we established in 2014, that the neutral policy rate today is probably lower than it has been historically. Um, but uh, it is, um, it probably, what I think investors therefore are missing uh, and this is why yields today probably, you could say, are at the lower end of their new range. And that range probably is two and a half, three and a half percent. What they're missing is the 1970s, 70s experience and the degree to which Fed Chair Powell uh, respects it. So, for example, real quickly, Arthur Burns from 70 to 78, then G. William Miller from 78 to 79, when the inflation rate would uh, decline, it's still a positive inflation rate, when there was some disinflation from the very high levels that existed then, they let the policy rate decline too. In other words, they let the real Fed funds rate move downward or stay the same. Whereas Paul Volcker, when the inflation rate started to decline, let the, kept the policy rate up because he knew, as, as Chair Powell probably does, and certainly most likely does, uh, that inflation expectations were the key. And the final ingredient to this, Lisa, is that we have new legions of uh, people in the public that believe that the inflation rate could accelerate. And so the Federal Reserve need be conscious of that. So uh, in other words, only boomers like me <laughs> thought the inflation rate could accelerate before this recent episode. Now today, millennials, Gen X, Y, Z, all are believers in the idea of faster inflation. So therefore, Federal Reserve in 2023 ought to be and probably will be cautious about cutting the policy rate and, and declaring victory on inflation when it moves down and will be a little Volcaresque in that sense and let the real Fed funds rate increase as the inflation rate comes down.
Tony, just quickly, Lisa mentioned that it's the best month for the S&P 500 going back to November of 2020. It is also the best month for global bonds going back to November of 2020. How long can they keep moving in the same direction? Well, Kelly, as I, as I mentioned, if, if you think of um, the valuation metrics and the possibility of recession and things of that sort, uh, perhaps for the bond market, yields are moving toward the lower end of the range. So in the three components for a bond's yield, the, the term premium, the new true policy rate or where the policy rate should be relative to uh, the inflation rate and inflation itself, um, you come up with the math, uh, most equations back of the envelope or more sophisticated seems to suggest a range ahead of two and a half, three and a half percent. What markets seem to be doing to some extent, at least in the bond market, is entertaining the idea that Fed can't go far. It's an idea it should have thought of uh, up anyway, and it's probably simply settling into a range. For the equity market, uh, some of it, of course, is, reflects the optimism that might be building, not just toward uh, the, the idea that the policy rate may not have to go as high as some feared, but that the economy is stronger, uh, at least its foundation is stronger than many thought. And there are lots of reasons to think that, ranging from the household sector's balance sheet, the housing sector, and the skinniness of inventories relative to history. Same for automobiles, the extremely strong banking sector, and the need for investments in defense and supply chains and uh, the, the green transition. Uh, so lots, lots of good things out there that investors are starting to think about. And again, for bonds, uh, the, I think it's there's just um, it's a reinforcement of the of confidence in the Fed, and the Fed has regained control of the inflation narrative, and uh, the markets are benefiting. You could say broadly, the final words, at least, Kaylee is um, benefiting from the Fed's tough love. This is way too constructive for six eleven in the morning, Tony. I don't know where this has come from. <laughs> Tony Crescenti of Pimco there. Tony, good to catch up, buddy, as always. With Kenny Lyons and Lisa Abramitz, I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market with a lift, piling into equities over the last couple of days post-Fed. We're up 8 tenths of 1% on the S&P, up more than 1% on the Nasdaq. This from Credit Suisse and Jonathan Golub. Whether or not we're in a recession will be debated by academics. Today's report unequivocally reflects a substantial weakening in economic activity, raises the likelihood of a dovish pivot by the Fed, and guess what? Quote, for now, bad news represents good news for stocks. More still to come. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Leanne Gerrans. The euro area economy has expanded by more than three times the amount economists expected. That comes at a time when inflation and a possible Russian energy cutoff threaten to send the region into recession. GDP rose seven tenths of one percent in the second quarter, but inflation set an all time high up 8.9 percent in July from a year ago. Now, President Joe Biden and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping have told aides to plan an in person meeting. That is according to a U.S. official. The two spoke on the phone for more than two hours yesterday. That call centred on Taiwan, a long-time flashpoint. Matters could get worse if House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visits the island on a trip to Asia. That does begin today. Beijing is warning of a firm response if that does happen. The Biden administration has approved the sale of $8.4 billion in weapons to Germany. The package includes F-35 fighter planes and new air launch cruise missiles. The State Department announcement made no mention of the war in Ukraine but it did say the sale would support a NATO ally that is an important force of stability in Europe. And Apple has offered just enough good news to buy itself some time. The company's quarterly revenue and profit narrowly beat estimates and iPhone sales held up better than expected. The CEO, Tim Cook, told Bloomberg TV that Apple is dealing with a slower economy, but he expects revenue to pick up again in the coming months. I'm Leanne Gerrins. This is Bloomberg. season is here. Buzzwords this earnings season, recession, inflation, foreign exchange, layoffs. We are starting to see, well, the world get a little bit more cautious about what these earnings are going to look like. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Second quarter earnings at Delta Airlines missed expectations. And that inflation print hit, my eyes were on Amazon in particular. With exclusive expert analysis. The issue here really is elevated cost. If you take a look at the projections, that is the story. Bloomberg Television and Radio, the fastest numbers and analysis you trust.
know there are challenges ahead of us. Growth is slowing globally. Inflation remains unacceptably high. And it's this administration's top priority to bring it down. Janet Yellen there, the US Treasury Secretary, rolled out after that negative GDP print yesterday. The recession debate yesterday was tedious, wasn't it? Bramo, my goodness, it went on all day. Okay, so I've been waiting for it. What's your rant? My rant is that if you ask a Republican, they'll tell you it's a recession. A Democrat, they'll tell you it won't. You ask Main Street, they'll tell you it sure feels like one. You ask Wall Street, good news is bad news. And you ask an ad academic, ultimately, NBER is our master. I put that out on Twitter yesterday. The whole thing drove me nuts. In the UK, this was really simple. Two consecutive quarters, negative growth, done. Over. We we'll call it a recession. Then you get to turn around and say, yes, it is a recession. But ultimately, there are some underlying points of strength here and we can talk about them. But it's become so politicized over here in the United States. And for certain people, they'll say, yeah, MBER. They say it's not just about death and duration. It's about diffusion. Look at the labor market. Look at the labor market. I'm with you. Ultimately, things are in a great place and they're getting worse. They're not getting better. And for a market participant, that is what you're focused on, right? Cheers. That's all I can say. I think we're in complete agreement. It was just a, it was it was a frustrating exercise because I felt like everyone was talking over the real issues that needed to if, be. Debated. If you're in this market, you're training on what the MBER might tell you in months to come. <laughs> I've got some well, IMF clearly. forecast to sell you if that's what you're into. <laughs> Futures on the S&P up seven tenths of one percent on the Nasdaq 100 up by more than one percent. Typically, when you make a lot of money in tough times, you yeah. may be a little quiet about it. Uh, Candy lights. The energy players are not quiet about this at all. Yeah, speaking of things getting politicized, John, just take a look at big oil. We know that they're raking in profits. We didn't know that they were raking in this much. Analysts only expected Chevron to have earnings of about 496 a share. It came in at 582 a share. That is a record and Chevron is returning more capital to shareholders with a $15 billion buyback. But Mike Worth, the CEO, seems to know how that would play with the Biden administration. In the statement, he kind of pushed back on the idea of profiteering or prioritizing shareholders over consumers, saying, we more than doubled investment compared to last year to grow both traditional and new business lines. Chevron is increasing energy supplies to help meet the challenges facing global markets. So uh, they're helping consumers too, John? Question mark? That's not going to be in the government's communications, that's for <laughs> sure. Lisa, they're going to lead with a $15 billion share repurchase program. I mean, that's what they're. That's what all of these companies are doing. That's what we saw yesterday from Shell. They're putting their money back, and they're not investing it in production because why should they if they don't have a clear backdrop on what the outlook will be like, what the regulatory backdrop will be for producing more in a year, in two years? Emily Wilkins down in D.C., ready to react to this. I'm Bloomberg government reporter. Emily, how do you think the White House responds to a $15 billion share rebuyback program from Chevron? I mean, one thing that you've seen the White House and you've seen Democrats kind of as a whole say is they've really put the blame for some of these high gas prices that we're seeing on oil companies, saying, look at the profits they are turning right now. Some of that needs to be passed along to the consumers. And that's really been the line that Democrats have stuck to, even as you've heard Republicans say that it's actually the Biden administration and their regulations that are causing really high gas prices right now. I think to a certain extent, even though you've heard uh, Secretary Pete Buttigieg, other White House House uh, folks come out and point to the fact that gas prices have been falling. They still know that this is way higher than most Americans were dealing with, even with last year, and that it is still a concern going into the no November election. How much is that the reason why, Emily, in the recent bill that possibly they will pass, having to do with targeting cleaner energy and investing in, in some of the uh, production there, how much are they looking for that to offset demand in some sort of real way in the near term versus just being an agenda point that was there but before the uh, pandemic and now has a reason to accelerate. I think there's a little bit of both in what you're seeing with this overall package that includes $369 billion for various climate initiatives, everything from research and development to uh, funding to help folks purchase electric vehicles, trying to incentivize that. One of the things you are going to hear Democrats make the argument on in this bill is that this is really going to help with energy security for the U.S. by trying to look at some of these cleaner energy alternatives, make the U.S. less reliable on 
on foreign oil and foreign gas. So expect that to be one of the big talking points that you're going to hear from the White House as they try and sell this bill, assuming, of course, that everyone's on board with it. We still don't know if Senator Kirsten Senma is a yes. Uh, there are, were some concerns that she had about that carried interest loophole that gets killed in this current or version of the bill. But the Senator Sinma really supports it. And that could lead her to be a no. If that's the case, this legislation is probably not going to go anywhere. Well, and of course, on the subject of clean energy spending, it also includes permitting for drilling on federal lands, which is how Joe Manchin probably got on board with it in the first place. So we have to keep in mind that both things are happening here. So if Kristen Sinema is on board, there's likely no path to reconciliation. What about the other legislation that they're still currently working on? So re reconciliation is really the big package that they are trying to work on right now. Lawmakers say that they are still reviewing the bill. It's more than 700 pages long. They want to take a close look at this. I think the biggest concern, though, at least from Manchin and from a number of other more moderate fiscally conservative Democrats, is will this impact inflation? And they've heard from folks like Larry Summers, who has been openly critical of the Biden administration, that this package will not, that the taxes that they are putting in place will offset the spending that they are doing, that it will decrease demand, that it will increase supply, and that the bill will ultimately be a good thing. So that's what Democrats are really banking on right now, that this won't be impacting those higher inflation numbers, and in fact might actually wind up helping Americans if they can pass certain things, like reducing the price of drugs. That might actually put more money American, in Americans' pocketbooks. Of course, Republicans are raising the red flag right now about the fact that this could impact inflation, uh, tying it back, of course, to other major bills that Democrats have passed uh, during Joe Biden's presidency. Emily, thank you. Emily Wilkins down in D.C. We'll catch up on that China call in the next hour. Bramo, I love that Larry Summers is now a source of reference for this administration when it comes to this bill for the whole of last year. Don't want to talk about what he's got to say. Maybe they're trying to say he's got more credibility because he basically... I don't know what's the correct way of saying it basically eviscerated their previous uh, spending think? plan and said that that was the reason why it caused the inflation that we're seeing now they're now using him as saying look even he supports us and he was uh, perhaps <laughs> really you know I mean, politics, us earlier. politics drives me nuts it just drives <laughs> no me insane should we talk about that call between the u.s yeah, leader and the that. chinese president two hours and 20 minutes how do you think this went when she turned around and said whoever plays with fire will get burnt. He said that before. This is his uh, line that he uses on Taiwan. What I found really interesting is that nobody said that it was a constructive call. In the past, everyone always talked about how it was a constructive call. On either side, on both sides, nobody said it this time. And not only that, but in two hours and 20 minutes, they agreed on meeting potentially in, in person. In person, yeah. But there was nothing else conclusive that came out of that. Is this a passionate, loose exchange where he says, play with fire, get burnt, or do you just kind of read it slowly and... Just make sure that you put that <laughs> quote out there and then the next guy reads his statement and your then own, the other guy reads his statement. Thrones. And you just happen to do that over a, a call. John Farrow, the screenwriter. Play with fire. <laughs> Get burnt. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. When it comes to the earnings, so far so good. That's the story this morning. Good morning. It was the story yesterday afternoon, whether it was Apple or Amazon this morning, whether it's Chevron or Exxon. Another upside surprise from Exxon just moments ago. Futures up by three quarters of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq, up by more than one full percentage point, supported by a really strong rally from the likes of Amazon and Apple with a decent gain as well. The last two days up by almost 3.9 percent on the S&P 500. Really powerful two days of gains. The why? Jonathan Gulliver, Credit Suisse, said it. When it comes to the economic data, it's a bad news. It's a good news story for this market. I hate that. And we're going to talk more about it in a moment. Did that sound sinister enough for you, Bramo? Yeah. In the bond market, twos, tens and thirties look that. like that. On a two-year yield, yesterday we came in about 13 basis points. That's fading the Fed story this morning. A small bounce up a basis point or so to 287.84 on a two-year. In Europe, stuck between a rock and a hard place, that is Germany and this ECB right now. German growth stagnated. You had some strength elsewhere, but that's problematic. How does this ECB respond to it with CPI? that far away from a nine handle in Europe and some people don't think we've seen the highs just yet. Euro dollar just about positive at 102.14, positive two tenths of one percent. Equities in Europe gaining on the stock 600 by eight tenths of one percent. And I have to say, Lisa Goldman, Sharon Bell out this morning saying she can smell the complacency from miles away. And they do not like this market 
at least right now. A lot of people have been talking about complacency, and thank you, John. Honestly, it, we're still seeing that rally continue, and we're still seeing a lot of short positions come out, and we are poised for the biggest rally going back to November 2020 in the S&P. Some people who last year were talking about how uh, there was a faulty call in transitory were included uh, among them Barbara Ann Bernard. She came out, and she was saying this is not the case. It's stickier. It's more protracted. You need to plan as such. She is founder. She is chief executive officer and chief investment officer of Windcrest Capital joining us right now from the Bahamas. Barbara Ann, can you just talk about what you make of this rally that we've seen so far in July, which might be the biggest going back to November of 2020? Thanks for the opportunity, Lisa. Yeah, I think this is a bear market rally for sure. And it's based on hope, not on free cash flow not on the free cash flow of the consumer and not on the free cash flow of the corporate. When you have, what we're looking at is negative real wage growth, which is why we have the lowest consumer confidence in 40 years. And what businesses are facing is the highest PPI rates in 45 years, which is why small business confidence is at an all time low. So these businesses are facing very little visibility over demand for their goods and the cost to produce them which is not a healthy situation. And meanwhile, the market is rallying on, like we said, hope, not free cash flow. So I, I'm, I don't think it's sustainable, unfortunately. Barbara, and let's go to the phrase that John Farrow hates the most, which is bad news is good news, which is what Jonathan Golub was talking about in his note today. That that's what it's become, that the more people start to talk pessimistically the way that you do, they talk about possibly some sort of pivot from the Fed. Why is this not the right way to look at it, since it has been the right way to look at it for the past few decades? Well, let's just break that down. Is bad news ever really good news? What you're talking about is the Fed will not raise rates. So we're talking about multiple expansion, not EPS expansion. And a healthy economy is based on EPS expansion. So, yes, you don't want to fight the Fed, but we also want a healthy economy, don't we? Well, in theory, Barbara Ann, yeah, I would assume so. But on the subject of the Fed and how they would likely view what we have seen in the equity market, a rally, financial conditions getting easier and not tighter, at what point will they have to push back on this? Well, I feel like they induced this rally. <laughs> it was the most confusing. I, uh, either I was on the, the wrong call or I, I completely <laughs> misunderstood the market. But what I heard was there's no more guidance because we're tired of being wrong. And then number one, our goal is to bring down inflation for a soft landing. But number two, we understand that's challenging and it's got more challenging in the recent months. None of that's positive to me. And then I think the real error was calling two and a quarter to two and a half a neutral rate. In my economics textbooks, that's not the case, particularly not when inflation's at 9%. So that is very stimulative and accommodative. And that's what's fueling um, you know, it, it, these forces that at the same time he's trying to squash. So he also said the dot plot is the best indicator. Well, what does the dot plot say? That we have 100 basis points of more increases this year and 50 next year. So rates are still rising and we have consumer and business confidence falling. We've never raised rates into falling confidence. Mm -hmm. And the other really interesting experiment is we've never raised rates when the U.S. Fed debt to GDP ratios are so high. So if we do induce a recession, the real risk out there is now you have lower tax receipts and higher interest expense, which is also not a pretty picture. So I'm, this is not easy. And I think as an active manager, what you want to do is really stay nimble and humble because we're now yeah. told we're going to focus on data, which is going to be much more volatile. Well, of course, Chairman Powell has said they need to be humble as well. As you're doing that, as you're being nimble and humble, what does that mean you want to buy? In the environment you're describing, which, as you say, we've never been in before, in theory, higher rates mean you don't necessarily want to be owning growth. And yet, if the economy is slowing, maybe you want that cash flow. So what do you do? It's a great question. So we actually are net short and we have a mountain of cash to buy great opportunities when we see them. We don't think we're there yet. Um, we have initiated two long new long positions all year. And so the barrier to entry to get into our fund right now is so high. So what does an attractive opportunity look at? We're talking about companies that are trading for the cash on their balance sheet when we're getting the operating business for free. So that kind of upside downside skew is the margin of safety I'm willing to take. Otherwise, we've been generating tremendous alpha on the short side. I think we have 36, actually I know we have 37 individual short positions. And this is a real stock picker's market. You would be very happy 
if you were long Amazon and not Walmart this week, right? That's a stock picker's choice. So being tethered to an index that I think has further downside is where I see the real risk. Barbara, and do you see a lot more potholes like the ones that we have seen in specific names? And I'm thinking of some of the darlings of uh, the pandemic era. Do you see more of that coming or is this just an ongoing bleed that the short positions will capture? No, absolutely. I mean, Lisa, if you think about this in a rising rate environment, it's crushing a whole cohort of companies whose business model was built on free money. And so all of that speculative has to drain the swamp. And so you're looking at companies that are over levered, you know, are counting on free money, um, and 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 they're they're really going to be in trouble. So we haven't seen the zombies uh, fully deflate yet. And then you're also looking at companies in the pandemic era that took on a ton of debt. You know, you just look at someone like Carnival Cruises, who just did a billion dollar equity raise and still has six times net debt to EBITDA. And if you go by what Royal Caribbean said this week, demand's not there. That is a problem. So, no, the shorts are very, very company specific. It's not it's more company specific than a macro view. But this is a real source of alpha generation in a market like this. This final point is so important not just Walmart versus Amazon, but Alphabet versus Facebook as well. Barbara Ann, fantastic to catch up with you. Barbara Ann Bernard there of Wincrest Capital. And Bramma, that's been the story of the week, hasn't it? If you looked at Walmart, retail's weak. You looked at Amazon, things are just about OK. Alphabet, things are all right. Resilient company. Google doing all right on the ad revenue. Facebook, dreadful. Snap, even worse. The dispersion within those industry groups is pretty interesting. Which raises a question of whether this is an execution issue or whether it's a consolidation of business issue with the ones that are going to win, winning big, and those that are not actually losing even bigger and having their business cycle accelerated to the downside. How much is that really the story, John, of the bifurcated earnings rather than a wholesale weakening that portends something uh, to come on a macro scale? Well, given the weightings of Amazon and Apple in the Nasdaq, we're right. doing OK this morning. We're at 1% and some. Here's the quote of the morning so far from Barbara Ann. There's no more guidance, Kaylee, because they're always wrong. Yeah, and they're tired of being wrong. She's essentially saying the equity market heard this entirely the wrong way, that what she heard from the chairman is that they are still going to be reacting heavily to inflation. And that is after an equity market that rallied two days, the best Fed rally, post-Fed rally we have ever seen. So it's interesting how you are having economists saying one thing, people like Barbara Ann saying one thing, and the market is feeling something entirely different, raising the question of is this Fed pivot now that the market seems to be focused on, one that realistically is going to be coming when it thinks it will. I wish there was a live feed of Lisa and I during the news conference with Chairman Powell, just watching this board of equities climb, and Lisa and I looking at each other <laughs> right with the mics off, throwing up our hands and going, what is going on? Another meeting with stocks rallying really hard. And is this an unintended, unwarranted loosening of financial conditions? And do you remember what Bill Dudley, Jeff Rosenberg yeah. both said? They were both pushing back hard. They both were very nicely saying we don't buy it and people are trading on hopium and how much is this really going to lead the Fed to come out with even tighter guidance. That said, and just to be contrarian to myself, uh, and I know that's head spinning, but I go to Gina Martin-Adams where she was talking about how this rally could be viewed as constructive, that we haven't gotten the best earnings and that a lot of these stocks still rally, that we know the bad news, stocks still rally. Is it hopium or are people saying it's all priced in and what are they pricing in? And the counter argument to that is I just don't see how the Fed is going to loosen conditions as early as next year if inflation doesn't come down way more and well closer to 2%. Well, rates climbed, didn't they? And that was poison for this equity market. And rates have dropped away. And that is seemingly bullish for this equity market. At some point, Lisa, you start to pivot and think about not rates are down, but why are rates down? And focus on that instead. And that's the point that Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley has been trying to make for a long time. You've got Mike Wilson on the, wrong, on the one side and on the wrong side right now. And you've got Marco Kalanovic of JP Morgan on the other side, who's been on the wrong side all year and he's on the right side right now because Bramo, this is what he's been looking for. I just really question whether that works this time around. How does the Fed loosen conditions? How do they back away from tightening conditions so quickly if we haven't gotten inflation down? If we have a seven handle, if we have a I, six handle, if we have a four handle on CPI, how can the Fed go ahead and say, you know what, we're going to start cutting rates? They risk going back to the 1970s, experiencing what happened in 1974, and that specter looms large over this Fed. Inflation has a nine handle. 
given the tone of the conversation this week, I think you could forget that sometimes. <laughs> I know. Futures on the S&P up eight tenths of one percent. On the Nasdaq 100 up by 1.2 percent. The earnings good enough from some of the big tech players helping out a massive week of gains. You roll in this dovish interpretation of this Fed and we're off to the races for the bulls in this market this week. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Leanne Gerrans. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is set to leave on a trip for Asia today. The question is whether she still plans to stop in Taiwan. Reports that she is considering a visit there have drawn harsh criticism from China, which considers Taiwan to be part of its territory. Meanwhile, Taiwan was one of the central issues discussed in a phone call between President Biden and China's Xi Jinping yesterday. Biden warned Xi against military action to reunify Taiwan with the mainland. Bloomberg has learned that the Chinese government did ask TikTok if it could open a stealth propaganda account. The goal was to target Western audiences with content that showcased the best side of China. TikTok turned down the request and said it would have violated guidelines. TikTok is owned by Beijing-based ByteDance. It has tried to distance itself from Chinese government influence. Right here in the UK, Rishi Sunak has admitted he is the underdog in the race to be the next prime minister but he is vowing to fight for every vote. While campaigning in Leeds, the former Chancellor admitted his pledge not to cut taxes until inflation is under control was not universally popular. Sunak's rival, the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, has promised to cut taxes as soon as she takes office. And shares of Amazon jumped in early training. The company showed its e-commerce and cloud computing business can churn out revenue even as customers worry about inflation. Amazon's second quarter sales beat estimates and it gave a revenue Revenue forecast for as much as 17% growth in the current period, plus fulfillment expectors rose less than expected. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Tank, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. We are really not seeing oil demand declines that you would expect um, from a, a kind of deep recessionary environment. Even with the kind of European and US demand declines, we still have global demand growth at 900,000 barrels per day year on year next year. And Rita Sen there, Energy Aspects Director of Research from New York. Good morning. Futures look like this, up eight tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, up by a little more than one full percentage point. The energy names out this morning with earnings, Chevron and Exxon. Kaylee, Exxon up by about three percent this morning. Yeah, as is Chevron, both of them beating expectations on profit. Chevron boosting its buyback program to $15 billion, so returning more capital to shareholders as they rake it in due to higher oil prices. But noteworthy, both of these companies seemingly throwing in a line for the Biden administration in their statements talking about how they're ramping up production and investment in capacity to try and meet demand. Of course, I don't know that the Biden administration will uh, see it that way as they talk about profiteering and price gouging. You think, Bramo, Exxon up 3%, Chevron doing OK. Do you think these buybacks slip under the radar this morning just because of what's been happening with gas prices? over the last month? That's exactly what I was going to say. Perhaps it's expedient for this administration to say, thank you, that's great, good job. You guys are really helping for the cause, and that's the reason why gasoline prices have gone down as much as they have. Just a group effort all round. Come by out. <laughs> Go team. Yeah, right. I mean... <laughs> Please. Stephen Short's got things to say, the principal of the Short Group, and he's going to say those things right now. Stephen, talk to me about why gas prices are down over the last month. Yeah, absolutely. When you tank the U.S. economy and you put the consumer up against the wall, they're going to respond. And demand for gasoline is well below normal at this point in the season. When we go ahead and we adjust, seasonally adjust where we expect demand to be, to be. and when we do our analysis, of course, we're going to take out 2020 because when we had the severe demand destruction. Uh, so we're not even uh, looking at those levels. But when we're looking at gasoline demand, that has been the driver uh, right now in the pullback in prices, unlike what Brian Deese, the White, White House uh, sp spokesman, who claimed about a month ago that the SPR release was 100 percent responsible, solely responsible for the pullback in gasoline. Uh, I just don't get it. Uh, back in June, gasoline prices peaked at over five dollars a gallon. When you look at the last 46 Junes, 
prices were 60%, six zero higher than the real, i.e. In, uh, inflation adjusted average of the last 46 uh, Junes. In July, even though we've had this pullback, prices are still 40% greater than the last 46 uh, Julys. So yes, we've had a bit, bit of a pullback. This is solely because of a pullback in demand here in the United States. And that said, we're still looking at much higher prices. And of course, this is beginning to transition into the earnings that we are now seeing reported by the big oil companies. Stephen, there's a lot here and a lot to unpack. I want to hone in on one uh, aspect of what you were saying, which is when you tank the economy, then you can get lower gas prices. I want to take issue with that because the earnings that we're getting yeah, they might be uh, weaker than in previous years in terms of the magnitude of beats, but they're still okay. And there is some constructive data out there. Do you think that this is re as a result of what's going on with Fed policy and the weakening uh, statistics? Or is this just a logical uh, demand side response to prices that were too high? Did we see where demand destruction kicks in? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm certainly on the boat that this is uh, a demand driven uh, at this point. You know, a little bit of the change in the calculus that, that everyone has had to deal with now is the impact of substitutes into the market. This is something we've never had to factor in. And of course, I'm talking about EVs and hybrids. So that threshold, that pain point for Americans where before it was about $3.60, $3.70 uh, retail at the pump, this is the, pr uh, the price point that we began to see demand destruction. Of course, that's risen uh, over the years. You know, I personally, as an anecdote, uh, I drive an electric hybrid. I get blended about 70 miles to the gallon. So I'm not as sensitive to price as I was 10 years ago. So that threshold ha has certainly moved higher. And clearly with gasoline prices at now at above $5 a gallon, we are now starting to reap those that benefit of the demand destruction. The consumer is responding. And let's keep in mind, we've also, we've also had some Substitutes, but the other thing that we've uh, we're, we're dealing with, we never had, and this, of course, is COVID, the lag of COVID demand destruction. And what I mean by this is one of the reasons why gasoline was always the most inelastic as far as demand was concerned is because one, we always had to drive to work, we always had to drive our kids to school. We no longer have to do that, right? We can work, and a number of us are still working from our homes. So even if as companies have opened up, and you know, again, an anecdote, my daughter, first job out of college, she wants to go into the office five days a week, but her office is only open two out of five, five days, and she has to work from home yeah. uh, for those three days. So we have that optionality again, which is again, raising the uh, price, but even with substitutes, even with our ability to drive fewer miles, demand destruction, of course, is starting to react to this. Well, obviously, there's optionality here in the United States, Stephen, but in China, sometimes you don't have an option and they just lock down entire a aspects yes. and, and groups of cities uh, as there's outbreaks. That doesn't seem like a policy changing in the near term. If and when it does, how does China factor into this price equation when that demand comes back? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, th that's that's an excellent question because clearly the problem, and, and this has been the problem, is we're not addressing the long-term structural imbalance globally between supply and demand. And to your point, demand is still masked. And look, this is what what you know, caught the industry, all industries, airline industry, food industry, so forth, uh, flat-footed on the rebound of demand from COVID. And to your point, we're not even fully back on that demand. So yes, we are adjusting here in North America. America and in Europe, but in China, because look, what Z says happens when he can he can shut down entire cities as he does. But if and when we ever do emerge from this COVID nightmare and that demand comes back, we're going to be in the same exact position that we were in the early 2000s. And what was that position? We went from the 80s and 90s where we underinvested in oil capacity, oil production, because the demand wasn't there and oil prices for those two decades lingered at well below $20 a barrel. But when demand started to come back in full force after 2000, after the dot-com recession, it wasn't just the United States, it was Europe. And of course, now it was China. This is when China's economic engine really became a factor. That is what was the key driver of driving oil prices from $40 a barrel to $150 a it's barrel. The in a short span, and that's where we're going this time when China finally does come back with their full uh, demand in this market. Stephen, awesome to get your view on things. Thank you, sir. Stephen Shork there, the Shork Group.
Talking about oil, the commodity market, and what's been happening with some of the energy players, Chevron up by 3.8% in early trading, up by 2.76% on Exxon. Those two names delivering some decent numbers this morning, some solid share buyback programs. Bramo, you know I'm happy to, to share any shade that gets sent my way, our way, on Twitter. Here's a line for you. Bloomberg, Ray Dalio and Goldman Sachs bashing Europe. Where the economy is growing, while the U.S. is in recession, where inflation is lower than in the U.S. and the whites are not fruity plonk. That coming on Twitter. Thank you. What do you make of that, the US versus Europe right now? If you break it down that way and just subtract the shade about the wine, I'm not sure where he's going. <laughs> but what do you make of that? I make that we're behind, uh, that Europe is behind where the US is in terms of the trajectory of the tightening. Does that mean that they're not ever going to get there? Unclear. They face a completely different scenario when it comes to uh, certain economic backdrops, I think. You think in energy? Yeah. Gas I mean, prices? I mean, that's, that's, that is lack of wage growth. the big tail risk going into yeah. year end without a doubt. But thank you for the insults <laughs> as always. Futures on the S&P up eight tenths of 1%. <laughs> live from New York, this is Bloomberg. has materially slowed down. We are not in the roaring 20s. We are not in the reflation trade. What we're seeing is what you would expect. Financial conditions tightening, the economy slowing down. Most importantly, inflation is coming in a lot slower than I've been expecting. Inflation just remains too hot for them to think they're going to stop. If there was a pivot, it was that meeting to meeting guidance for viewpoint from Chair Powell. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Tom is not here, so what are we calling today? ECI Friday. It is ECI Friday. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together this morning, I'm pleased to say we're with Kaylee Lines, TK back on Monday, and Bramo ECI, the Employment Cost Index. We get some data a little bit later this morning. How much does this really shape the narrative that, yes, inflation is cooling and that the Fed can actually uh, step on the brakes when it comes to the rate hiking plan? And how much does it go the opposite way? Because we have seen the Employment Cost Index rise at a record pace. Do we continue you to see that or is there going to be some sort of pause in that narrative and we've really chipped away at rate hike expectations in a monster way in the last week i'm struggling with that i'm really struggling with where people are getting the confidence the conviction that this fed is going to pivot whatever you want to call it back away from some of their hawkish projections earlier in the year at a time when we still have 9.1 percent cpi when we still have rents that are climbing when we still have basic staples that are climbing how can you explain a fed that's going to feel justified to start cutting rates as soon as the first quarter next year which is currently what's being priced in so that's the economic data let's do the earnings the earnings from apple and amazon yesterday afternoon the earnings from exxon and chevron this morning they're all doing great so everyone's doing really well and that seems to be the reaction in markets but the bar has been lowered i mean exxon and chevron are a different story right if you take a look at amazon if you take a look at apple the bar had already been lowered so much and those shares have been so beaten up that now we get to a question of what's been priced in amazon absolutely flying caddy yeah. lines are up by 12.5 percent yeah i don't know if it's so much that they're doing great as that they're not doing as bad as people feared that they might. Consuming Amazon is a very consumer-facing company, and their sales are holding in there. The revenue guidance held in there. That kind of eases some of the concern about a pullback in spending. But these beats weren't by huge margins, especially for Apple. They just came in just above expectations. I loved the note over at uh, Wedbush, Dan Ives, saying that it was a Top Gun Maverick quarter for Apple because they're dealing with a really significantly uh, difficult environment, like flying inverted and low terrain. But they're dealing with it. It doesn't mean they're, you know, shooting. Some Sometimes Dan Ives absolutely loses me. I'm going to catch up with Dan a little bit later <laughs> around the opening bell. Can they keep this up, Kaylee? Given what we've heard from AT&T and T-Mobile about people delaying their bills, if people are struggling to pay their bills, are they going out to buy a new iPhone? later this year? Well, that's exactly the question, John. So far, iPhone demand, at least in the quarter just reported, seems like it was hanging in there. But if we're talking about an actively deteriorating macroeconomic environment, I can't imagine that picture is going to get easier for Apple or any of these other companies that are facing a consumer struggling with inflation. Apple right now up 2.4%. If you're just tuning in, we've got to rally again, up eight tenths of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, up more than one full percentage point. A big two-day pop. Over the last two days, the S&P 500 up by close to 39 
9%. So equities up again, investors piling gear, Amazon up by more than 12% and yields with a little bit of a bounce, up two basis points, 270 on a 10-year. And Lisa, Euro with some strength off the back of better than expected GDP figures, but at the same time, Eurozone CPI heading in the wrong direction. And where are the better than expected figures? They're not coming from Germany. And that's a problem because that's the economic engine. And there you see stagflation. You see a real deterioration, at least versus some of the expectations. How does that play out? We're looking at the employment cost index. ECI Friday, 8.30 a.m. We get that for the second quarter. It had been rising at a record pace. And this really comes as a lot of companies were dealing with an extremely tight labor market. Do we get a sense that that is softening? Do we get a sense that, invest, that employees have to do less in order to track empl empl employers are doing less to attract employees and how much does this really feed into the conviction that markets have the fed won't go as far as they were saying earlier at 10 a.m we get the july uh, university of michigan sentiment survey it had been deteriorating to near record pace we had seen people pulling back a little bit from those longer term inflation expectations how much does this continue to deteriorate versus get a little bit fortified at least by the feeling that perhaps this is near term pain for longer term gain at least that's what janet yellen is trying to paint it as and what other people are trying to say this actually the issue is how much does it become a self-fulfilling prophecy of recession if we keep talking about it and today we do get the ongoing earnings parade we got Chevron and Exxon earlier later we get Colgate Palmolive and Procter and Gamble how much do we get this ongoing reaction John where even bad news is treated with good news even the misses are treated with a rally two days after at least if you take a look at the averages of this earnings period this has not been an earnings period marked by strength but this has been an earnings period marked by not the worst case scenario as Kaylee was talking about. Is it something you want to fight right now? Because this move looks pretty powerful again this morning, up three quarters of 1% on the S&P. Lisa, thank you on the NASDAQ, up by more than one full percentage point. Joining us now is Salita Marcelli, Chief Investment Officer for the Americas at UBS Global Wealth Management. Salita, let's start here. I want your view on the following. Is this something you want to chase or something you want to fade? I don't think this, this is not something I want to chase. Look, I think uh, the market is uh, have seen earnings that are not as bad as feared and perceived Fed to be dovish because they're data dependent and data is coming a little bit softer. But I don't think Fed is pivoting here. I don't think the market is pivoting. There's a long way to go. Uh, at least in the short term, it's going to be much more choppy. I think we're going to see some of these gains uh, taken out in the market. So I wouldn't necessarily be chasing it at this point. However, um, if you put your long-term investor lenses on, then it is still a great time to invest. There's still a lot of opportunity, it's just that the next uh, six months, I think, is going to be uh, quite volatile. After this earnings season is over, Salita, what are you looking at for the catalyst for the declines that you're talking about? Well, first of all, um, in, in this earnings season, we heard a lot of talk of recession, but we haven't seen any indication in the results. Right? We are, we're not seeing broad-based um, layoffs. There's maybe slowing of hiring, um, and, and consumers are still resilient, even though we heard that you know, low-income households may be seeing some pressures from Walmart, from AT&T. Uh, it, it's still consumers are resilient. Visa told, told us that uh, credit card spending has been very strong. Um, we're seeing still travel leisure, um, you know, seeing a lot of great demand. So I think what we would be looking at is, first of all, uh, what is happening on the um, hiring or, 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 or em employment side. And in any case, that's what Fed is looking at as well, right? More than anything else, wage growth is important. And if they can see that the vacancies are coming down and that takes some of the pressure of the wage growth, that would give us a sense that they maybe they will be able to pivot. But if the you know, if we see otherwise, then, um, you know, it probably means that uh, the consumer spend, real consumer spending that has been flat so far will probably turn negative uh, and there's going to be a higher probability of a recession coming towards the end of this year. Well, Salita, we were catching up with Barbara and Bernard of Wincrest Capital in the previous hour, and she agrees that the market got this Fed entire Fed conversation wrong, that the pivot isn't necessarily coming, that it wasn't as dovish as the market perce perceived. And she said for that reason, given the environment she's looking at, she is sitting on a mountain of cash. Is it right to be sitting on a mountain of cash right now? Um, I don't believe so. I mean, you, you, as an investor or as, as our clients, private wealth clients, you should have enough cash, uh, you know, to get you through the next six months and liquidity for the next uh, two to three, three years for expenses. But beyond that, I think there is the, the benefits of staying on the sidelines, staying in cash is limited, but the opportunity cost 
of uh, being out of the market for the long term is much, much bigger. Um, you know, I, I think we did so many analysis on this uh, in our team. Um, you know, if, 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 if you wait for historically going back to 1960s, if you wait for another 10% downside and then get in and then sell at the brand new highs, you are most likely to underperform uh, 80 times versus a buy and hold strategy. So I would say this is, like I said before, for a long-term investor is still a great time to invest because we have below uh, average valuations in the equity market. We have seen almost 25% derating compared to the last 12 months, um, right? And uh, when you look back since 1960, that is sort of consistent with return expectations of about seven to 9% annual for the next decade. You have bond yields that are um, close to highest since 2018. And before that, the highest was 2008. So, um, you know, starting point in bond yields is actually a good indication of your total returns. Uh, and then you have in alternatives, even in the private equity space, right? You might see for existing funds valuation downgrades in the near term, um, but data tells us that funds that are launched um, a, a year after the peak or after a significant sell-off in the in the um, public markets tend to have superior returns over the long term. So I think staying in cash is not the best strategy if you have long-term horizon. Salita, I've got 20 seconds. I'll give you a five-year buy and hold. You've got to pick one thing. What would it be? As boring as it may sound, it's a well-diversified portfolio. I think that's still I, the why did only, I ask? only why did, why did I ask? free lunch. Why did I ask? Salita, thank you. Salita Marcelli there of UBS Global Wealth Management. I like how UBS recommends you keep enough cash to get you through six months. Lisa, I imagine that their clients need significantly more cash than maybe you and I do to get through <laughs> and six they months. Have a significantly yeah, bigger. I think they're doing okay. Mountain of cash to put that aside. What did you think she was going to say? Go all in on Pinterest. Just giving her a chance, just to, you know, <laughs> no, to have an original moment. No, I'm kidding. It, this has been sort of the uh, the key issue for a lot of longer term managers. They all want to say, "Look, we see short term pain, but don't get too scared. Everything's okay. Stay put." That seems to be what it was. The Nasdaq is up more than 14 percent, Kaylee, mm -hmm. off the lows of June. Yeah, and the S and P is heading for its best month since November of 2020. This has been a powerful equity rally, John. How much of this is due to the fact that a lot of negativity had been priced in and earnings are actually hanging in there okay? And how much of this is a market betting on a Fed pivot that may or may not come? We're adding some weight to this rally this morning, that's for sure. Live from New York City this morning, good morning. If you're just tuning in, we're up another 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq 100, up by more than one full percentage point. The data out of Europe not great on the CPI side of things. That comes in hot. GDP doing OK, unless, of course, you're looking at Germany. Can we call it stagflation in Germany now? Yeah, I think Ramo, we call it stagflation can, in most places Can in we the go world. there in the US? I think we can go there too, right? Absolutely. Euro dollar, 102.26, positive a third of 1% on the euro. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Leanne Gerens. President Joe Biden and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping have told aides to plan an in-person meeting. That is according to a U.S. official. The two spoke on the phone for more than two hours yesterday. The call centered on Taiwan, a long-time flashpoint. Matters could get worse if House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visits the island on a trip to Asia that begins today. Beijing is warning of a firm response if that does happen. The Biden administration has approved the sale of $8.4 billion in weapons to Germany. The package includes F-35 fighter planes and new air-launched cruise missiles. The State Department announcement made no mention of the war in Ukraine, but it did say the sale would support a NATO ally that is an important force for stability in Europe. The euro area economy has expanded by more than three times the amount economists did expect. That comes at a time when inflation and a possible Russian energy cutoff threatened to send the region into recession. GDP rose seven-tenths of one percent in the second quarter quarter, but inflation set an all-time high, up 8.9% in July from a year ago. Shares of Intel are falling. The semiconductor maker slashed sales and profit forecasts for the rest of the year. The CEO, Pat Gensler, said that Intel needs more time to make its products competitive. At the same time, he assured investors that the current quarter will be the low point. Global News, 24 hours a day 
on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. season is here. Buzzwords this earnings season, recession, inflation, foreign exchange, layoffs. We are starting to see, well, the world get a little bit more cautious about what these earnings are going to look like. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Second quarter earnings at Delta Airlines missed expectations. When that inflation print hit, my eyes were on Amazon in particular. With exclusive expert analysis. The issue here really is elevated cost. If you take a look at the projections, that is the story. Bloomberg Television and Radio, the fastest numbers and analysis you trust. This bill will reduce inflationary pressures on the economy. This bill will, in fact, reduce inflationary pressure on the economy. It's a bill that cost, uh, will cut your cost of living and reduce inflation for, and it lowers the deficit. It strengthens our economy for a, in the long run as well. That was the President of the United States yesterday from New York City this morning. Good morning with Kenny Lyons and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK back with us on Monday. Your market looks like this. A lift up six or seven tenths of one percent on the S&P, up more than one percent on the Nasdaq 100. The earnings really decent so far relative to expectations, of course. Amazon, Apple, take your pick. Exxon, Chevron this morning after the tech beach yesterday afternoon. Yield tie by a couple of basis points on a 10-year, 269.57. Fed funds, Lisa, the path for Fed funds. This is going to get interesting. President Bostic out. I'm very, very interested in what the Fed speak is going to sound like over the next week or so, given the market reaction to the Fed meeting just on Wednesday. OK, so Rafael Bostic coming out saying the U.S. is not in a recession, which sounds positive, but good news is bad news. If you want to talk about bad news is good news, which I know you love so much. Um, this is why the Fed is raising rates to curb inflation. In other words, the strength in the economy that is not the recession that seems to be suggested by the data is the reason why the Fed can go ahead and talk about this. But here's the tortured aspect. They're trying to twist themselves in knots and do an administration pivot and say, we still understand that people are hurting. So this is a very tough message to get right. But what this seems to underscore is, yes, there is a slowdown, but no, it is not enough to stop us from raising rates. As the conclusion from the Atlanta Fed President, Kaylee, there is more work to be done. Yeah, and the question is how and how fast are they going to do this? Bostic saying that the pace and size of future Fed rate hikes depends on the data, John. And of course, we're going to get more data just about an hour and 10 minutes from now, including that employment cost index, which Chairman Powell told us himself on Wednesday they're going to pay close attention to. Those headlines from an interview with NPR News this morning with the Atlanta Fed president. Any more Fed speak will bring you that Fed speak. We need to talk about a call the president had with the president of China at 8.30 Eastern. When we all saw that GDP data, the president was busy talking about the relationship between the world's two largest economies. Emily Wilkins joins us now, government reporter down in D.C. Emily, two hours and 20 minutes. What was the outcome of that call? So the outcome could be the first potential meeting between President Biden and President Xi since Biden has become president himself. Um, obviously, the White House has talked about just the importance of keeping the line of communication open between Washington and Beijing. The fact that while there are tension points between the U.S. and China, there are also things that they are working on as well. And so we're certainly keeping an ear out for any additional news on that meeting. They also talked about Taiwan in advance of Speaker Pelosi's uh, reported trip there. There. Um, and President Xi gave Biden a bit of a warning. He said, you know, that those that play with fire will get burned. Uh, Biden reaffirmed that the U.S. is perfectly happy with the current status quo, that they do not want to undermine peace in the region. I think that is a continuing point of contention. It will be interesting to see um, what Speaker Pelosi's trip is actually going to lead to. Uh, China has promised a strong retaliation if she does go to the island. It will be very interesting to see what that looks like. Do we hear anything about tariffs? I think tariffs are certainly something that's very much on the mind for uh, Washington and Beijing officials well, trying to figure out Emily, the reason why it, I ask, because I didn't hear about it in any of the in any of the reports from this particular meeting, and I'm just wondering if that in itself is interesting, that the emphasis was entirely on Taiwan and all of the communications and nothing related to the economy. 
I mean, it definitely is interesting, especially when you've heard that President Biden was considering removing some of the tariffs on these goods uh, when he's talked about how what impact that might have on the economy and what impact that might have on inflation. I mean, honestly, Lisa, there were a lot of t big topics between the U.S. and China that we really did not see in the readouts of either country. And I think it raises some real questions about, you know, the extent of what was discussed, the tone of what was discussed. I mean, certainly things couldn't have gone that bad if they are planning an in-person meeting. But I think there are still lots of question marks about what the relationship between the U.S. and China is going to look like going into the future. Well, and obviously we can talk the foreign policy and the relationship geopolitically between the U.S. and China and how if Nancy Pelosi visits Taiwan, that will be affected on a geopolitical scale. On a domestic scale, if she doesn't see it through and make that visit, how does that play, especially among her colleagues in Congress? I mean, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, certainly no fan of Nancy Pelosi's, was really encouraging her to go, saying that if she canceled the trip, it would be handing a victory to Beijing. And you've heard the same from Republicans and Democrats on both sides of the aisle, really encouraging Pelosi to continue with this trip. It really seems at this point that the main concerns are coming from the Defense Department and the Pentagon, who, of course, have to be concerned about the speaker's safety as she travels to this particularly contentious part of the world, trying to game out all of the potential situations scenarios that could happen, making sure that she remains safe. I mean, this is the highest level U.S. official to visit the island in over 25 years. It's certainly a huge trip, and, and it really has to go off without a hitch. Emily, I don't think we fully appreciate how serious this is. When you talk about we need to seriously think about how to protect the Speaker of the House going to a foreign place. Emily, when was the last time we had a conversation that sounds like this one? I mean, all, of course, there's usually a lot of security around any sort of proposed Of course, proposed but, this, trip but this is different, Emily. But we're this we're, one talk, is, we're talking is. about people out there talking about potentially some kind of confrontation. And I think there's a question, there's just a really high potential for something to happen, right? If there's a miscommunication, if there's a minor slip up, if things could escalate fairly quickly. And I think that is the real concern here. And certainly Speaker Pelosi, she's been in office for a number of years. She's an experienced diplomat on going abroad. I don't think the concern so much lies with her as it does just with the tension right now that's going around and just how highly sensitive that relationship right now is between Washington and Beijing. Emily Wilkins, great work. Dan in D.C., as always, what an important moment. Emily Wilkins there down in Washington. The more we talk about the tension between the U.S. and China and how Taiwan is a part of that, we've got to focus even more on what's happening domestically in China because that's not getting discussed as much. We've just put out a story, according to people familiar with the matter, Lisa, China is considering a plan to seize undeveloped land from distressed real estate companies, using it to help finance the completion of stored housing projects that have sparked mortgage boycotts across the country. We have some social unrest in that country, and this is being a distraction away from that over the last week or so. And we need to make sure that we, we watch both things at the same time. It's a well, it's a well put point, and that was my thought when I saw this. Is the Chinese authorities are trying to uh, alleviate some of the social unrest that is bubbling up from the bottom, and what you hear about is all of these people who have put money down on homes that have not been built and being forced to continue to pay debt for those properties, starting to boycott and get really upset. China now potentially addressing that highlights their concern about the social unrest. Both leaders facing some yeah. domestic issues in a big way when it comes to the economy. Futures right now up six tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq up by more than one percent. The numbers from Amazon and Apple good enough to drive some decent gains this morning. We'll talk about the economic data in about an hour from now. Some employment cost index figures just around the corner. Apple and Amazon, two names that make up about 20% of the Nasdaq 100. And when one of them's up more than 12%, you're probably guaranteed some decent gains this morning. And that's what you've got on the Nasdaq right now, up by almost 1%, close to one percentage point higher on the Nasdaq 100, on the S&P 500, up around about six tenths of 1%. The numbers out of Exxon, Chevron, pretty tidy as well. So, so far, so good this morning. So far, so bad, and apparently that is good. Doesn't make sense, does it? That seems to be the story once again on Wall Street yesterday off the back of GDP, a contraction and yields come in. Let's look at yields right now. Two's, tens and thirties down 13 basis points yesterday, this morning, up by not even a basis point, 286.83.
We're data dependent. Let's look to the data. The ECI out a little later this morning, 8.30 Eastern time. Then you miss Consumer Sentiment Survey, which has become so important for Chairman Powell over the last few months. Lisa's got things to say on that. I know she has. Consumer inflation expectations over a certain time horizon is a critical point for them. You, Mitch, I think is about 500, 600 phone calls, and there you go. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. Let me talk about euro dollar. The data are out of Europe, CPI in the eurozone, close to a nine handle on inflation, but GDP was better than expected. Does that open the door for more rate hikes from this ECB? Euro dollar 102.20. Germany, though, stagnating. And that's going to be a problem because this, this is only going to get worse in the minds of many people. JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, all out there talking about the prospect of a recession in the Eurozone, not next year, this year. That's the story for Europe right now. A rock and a hard place and an ECB that thinks it's going to keep on hiking rates. For how long? I don't know. Euro dollar 102, 21. That's the cross asset price action. Let's get you some better news. We can do that with Bramo. Hey, Lisa. Hey, how's it going, John? And definitely it's a better news story than the stagflation that you're talking about around the world. Amazon is not Walmart. That was my big takeaway yesterday. We saw the downgrades from Walmart, the likelihood of that same kind of uh, trend in Target. Amazon delivered that they were able to maintain and beat, and that is causing a massive rally. Those shares up more than 12%. Apple also just kicking across, as Kaylee mentioned, uh, the earnings beat, and they are up 2.3%. They were also able to maneuver through through some of the supply chain issues, particularly in China. Intel, however, however, in the story of haves and have nots is a big have not. They offer up some really dire, uh, dire uh, projections for the year ahead, talking about a lack of demand for chips. We have seen this across the chip sector, those shares getting absolutely hammered down 11.2%. And in the story of the haves and the have nots, the darlings of the pandemic era that have absolutely gone the other way, full round trip, Roku is the poster child for that because yes perhaps alphabet was able to get their advertising revenue up roku not so much those shares down 22.9 nearly 23 percent just to give you some perspective those shares trading uh, set to open at 65 dollars and 72 cents Back in July of last year, they were trading at near $500 a share, John. Just to give you a sense of some of the uh, the momentum that's been kicked out from under some of these I'd companies. I've lost sight of that. That's ridiculous. Isn't that? I mean, this just sort of speaks to how much things got pumped up. And then the crash, I mean, that's dramatic. And we're seeing that ongoing. Chevron and Exxon, we were talking about, and Kaylee did a really good job of parsing through the strength and how they were trying to position it ahead of uh, what the White House is going to say. Chevron shares up nearly 4%. Exxon shares up 2.3%. But just uh, to give you a sense of perspective, Exxon shares have absolutely skyrocketed this year, John, and much more so than Chevron. Cash machine. Yeah. Cash machine, given what's going on. Lisa, thank you. Joining us now is Tom Titsouris, the head of fixed income research at Strategus, a bad company. Tom, always good to catch up with you. Michael Hartner of Bank of America out this morning saying to sell the S&P if it hits 4,200, it's too early to price the Fed pivot. Is it too early to price the Fed pivot? Yeah, I, I do believe so. I think we're still at great risk of a recession here. But really, what I think simply what we're seeing here in both the equity and bond markets is that the markets are saying that the Fed, because it's relying so heavily on using the Fed funds rate to tighten monetary conditions instead of the balance sheet, the market is saying that the Fed very well may not be able to get to a point where balance sheet reduction can harm risk assets because the economy, Main Street, very well may wobble into recession and the Fed might have to pivot. But even with that, I think a recession is still the most likely outcome here, and I think it's, it's too early to be calling a, a bottom in, in equities. So talk to me about how much they're going to hike into this, hike into this weakness, because that's what we're talking about when it comes to the Federal Reserve. Tom, I asked this question a little bit early this morning. It's a pe peculiar situation because nominal GDP is flying, yet real GDP is contracting, and it's unusual to have two, two quarters of that, Tom. How do you think the Fed responds to that? Yeah, I think the Fed really has no choice. They have to continue to tighten, but whether they tighten at the pace that they're going at, 75 basis points a month, or they slow that down, that's the real question, I think. But nonetheless, I think their their peak here in the Fed funds rate is likely to be 350, perhaps even as high as 375. And so that means that they're going to go at least another 50 basis points in the next meeting and then possibly slow that down to 25. But they're, they're going to have to tighten into real economic weakness because, as you mentioned, nominal GDP is so high. Tom, I'm struggling to understand the rationale then of the junk bond traders that have pushed up valuations there and headed that asset class for the biggest monthly gain in decades. Decades. Tom, how does this make sense when you talk about a scenario of hiking into weakness, of dealing with stagflation? 
Yeah, I, I think, again, it really comes down to the Fed's lack of use of the balance sheet. We've often said at Strategus, when you use the Fed funds rate to tighten monetary policy, you put more of that strain on Main Street. When you use the balance sheet, you put more of that strain on Wall Street, which we can broadly view as large companies, the U.S. Treasury, the largest states. The Fed has just simply said, we're not going to use the balance sheet. It's going to be a very passive tool. Okay, and I'm looking right now at the balance sheet, which ticked down to $8.9 trillion from a high of about $9 trillion. It's really just dramatically rolled off. I'm being a little bit sarcastic because yeah, uh, people are talking about quantitative tightening, and it's begun, and it's begun at a pretty snail's pace. Tom, are you basically saying that you're going to feel it on Main Street much more than in corporate America, and that's being reflected in asset prices? Yeah, and just to give you an understanding of just how disproportionate this tightening is, the amount of rate hikes the Fed has put in place, we'll call it 250 basis points, we estimate an equivalent amount of balance sheet reduction would have been about $4 trillion. So we're well behind that. All right. So uh, translating into what that means for the trajectory of, of yields in this bond market, I know you think we've probably seen the peak. How far away are we from the trough? That's a good question. Right now, that trough, our expectation of trough is probably not much below 250 and possibly even 250 itself. We think you're going to see 10-year yields, for the most part, bouncing between a 250 and a 325 for the next 12 months. And what does that mean for the curve, considering the short end is thinking the Fed is going to do something else entirely than it thought about a month ago? Yeah, I think it, it generally means that the curve, twos, tens, is likely to continue to invert, albeit at a slower pace than we've seen to this point. So we could see another about 15 to 30 basis points of further inversion in twos, tens. And that's going to depend on whether or not the market price is a terminal funds rate of 325 or 350. And Tom, what's more important today, ECI or you, Mitch? Uh, ECI. Uh, wages are the most important measure, in my opinion, whether it's average hourly earnings or ECI, because simply put, wages are going to tell you where inflation is going to get sticky. So right now it's telling us it's sticky CPI around 5% if the Fed doesn't tighten further. Shout is telling us it's sticky right now, that's for sure. Tom, thank you. Tom Titsouris there of Strategus. Please to see him in the studio here in New York City too. Lisa, 8.30 Eastern time. We get that data. Then a little bit later this morning, we'll get you, Mitch. So what do you think is the uh, reaction in markets? If ECI comes in hot, how much does that tank this market? I mean, that's basically good news in terms of the consumer having more buying power will be viewed as bad news. That's my projection. What's yours? Yeah, I won't give you the magnitude because I can't tell you how much we'll move by. I'll give you the direction. You'd imagine that we'd have an adverse reaction in a market that's been pricing out the Fed that might have to price it back in if that's what we get this morning. On the flip side, if we get a weaker than expected employment cost index, if it, there is less momentum in the wages for employer employees, how much does that give some momentum to the trade versus already having been baked in? The parameters of risk right now are, are skewed, it seems, to uh, perhaps the bad news, just because right now there's a lot of you know potential pivot talk that's been baked in. That is the trade. You just described it. That's why the Nasdaq is up by close to 1% including the earnings this morning on the S&P up another six tenths of one percent. Katie, the road to September is so long. <laughs> so There's long. so much data to get through between now and then. And we've got a one stop meeting over in Jackson Hole as well, where if they want to communicate something, they can. Yeah, and I know you, Tom, John, and you three will be there to hear it in person, which is exciting for you guys. But yeah, I mean, the point of the story is you can't guess right now what the data is going to look like in September and how the Fed is going to respond to it, considering they gave up on guidance. We were told earlier the reason they did that is because they're tired of being wrong. So now you have to look at the data and just try and guess how the Fed is going to react to it, because are they really going to tell us? Well, it's difficult to guess how the Fed's going to react to anything, because I don't know what the Fed is reacting to still. Lisa, if you really lay this out, and that's been the biggest complaint against this Fed, this is why Tom and I often argue about this, they say they are data dependent. That is fine. But you have to define how you're dependent on that data. And they haven't really done that. Which data point matters? One minute's ECI. Then it's you, Mitch. Then it's headline. Then it's core. Then it's headline, but it's core. <laughs> what is it? And now people are saying it's jobs because they were talking about the strength in the labor market. So if there's weakness in the labor market, then what's the reaction function? Then, then do they pivot? Then do they say, OK, we're not going to raise rates? Or are they still concerned about the headline CPI number? Their heads perhaps are spinning, but they're not giving any guidance to markets. And there was a real frustration that we've heard in a lot of investment managers saying, we have no guidance. We don't know what you're going to do. You're going to dictate the path of this market. And so people are saying, well, they're just going to be forced to be done. And that seems to be the assumption that's baked into the market right now. I don't know how much these corporations can offer guidance either, particularly around inventories. And Kelly, it's interesting to me that inventories is such a major part of the GDP story as well, because these retailers, 
they don't know where their business needs to be yeah. a year round, and they don't know how to calibrate their business for the economy further down the road. And we've talked about some of the retailers. They're well positioned now for an economy that existed 12 months ago, and things have changed very quickly since then. Yeah, it goes to show you timing is everything. Working so hard to get all the supply because demand was so strong for certain products, now the demand has evaporated as inflation bites into consumers' wallets, and now you're stuck with inventory that you need to get down. And yes, maybe that will be a disinflationary force, but it's not great for the bottom line of these companies as they face very, very real margin pressure. We've seen it with Walmart. We've seen it with Target. Yeah. It's a thing that's happening, John. Lisa, I'm with you. Execution doesn't get talked enough about in earnings season. If you just looked at Walmart, things are terrible in retail. Amazon, maybe a slightly different story than if yeah. you just looked at Alphabet versus, say, Facebook or a Snap. Again, there's much more dispersion out there than I think uh, a lot of people are giving them credit for. Consolidation among the stronger players, of course. Walmart doesn't have AWS. Yes, just true. Side story. Well, I mean, that's very true. I just got <laughs> some investment advice from a Bloomberg Terminal subscriber. Go to cash. <laughs> who, who do you think that guy is? Tom, good morning. S TK, go back to bed. <laughs> Futures on the S&P, up six tenths of 1% on the NASDAQ, up by eight or nine tenths of 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Leanne Gerrans. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is set to leave on a trip to Asia today. The question is whether she still plans to stop in Taiwan. Reports that she is considering a visit there have drawn harsh criticism from China, which considers Taiwan to be part of its territory. Meanwhile, Taiwan was one of the central issues discussed in a call between President Joe Biden and China's Xi Jinping yesterday. Biden warned Xi against military action to reunify Taiwan with the mainland. Now China is looking at a new way of resolving those mortgage boycotts that have broken out across the country. Bloomberg has learned the government is considering seizing undeveloped land from real estate companies and using it to help finance the completion of stalled housing projects. Homebuyers are holding back mortgage payments because developers have failed to finish building their homes. France's President Emmanuel Macron has asked Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to help Europe move away from Russian oil and gas. At a dinner in Paris, Macron stressed the importance of continuing the coordination with Saudi Arabia. Macron has reached out to leaders of other oil-producing countries, including the UAE and also Iran. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. We do see significant slowdown in growth. That's um, to be expected given how rapidly the economy grew when it was recovering from the pandemic and all of those job losses and policy was designed to do that, we should expect to see a slowdown. This economy is at full employment. Secretary Yellen there on the economy after a second straight quarter of negative growth in America. From New York City this morning, good morning. Tom Keen away, Lisa Bravitz, Katie Lyons, myself, Jonathan Ferro. Futures up six tenths of one percent on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, up by one full percentage point. Yields higher by about a basis point. Your tenure, 269.21. Keep checking in on Amazon. It's off the highs, but Lisa is still up 11 percent in early trading. That's quite a move. They benefited both from their cloud computing unit, their AWS, which did better than expected, but also because they don't have the same kind of inventories. They have other people selling the stuff on their platform, so they aren't left with the same kind of hangover that Walmart and others are left with, which I think is a, a sort of understated story here. We'll keep you up to speed on that. As I say, I'll catch up with Dan Ives of Wedbush around the opening bound a little bit later this morning. A big question down in Washington at the moment. Will Speaker Pelosi go to Taiwan? Joining us now is Isaac Boltanski, Policy Research Director at BTIG. Isaac, this feels like lose-lose. I know you think it feels like lose-lose. Which loss is she going to take? It feels incredibly difficult 
for her to pull back at this stage. My sense is that she's going to have to go to Taiwan. I think that the optics would be absolutely atrocious if she skips out on it now, and it would be a terrible signal given, given our relations with Taiwan. So, Isaac, how does President Biden deal with this, and what does this do to his agenda when he's focused on this and he spent two hours and 20 minutes speaking about that with Xi Jinping rather than everything else at a time when he's losing support rapidly? Yeah, look, I think that from a practical perspective, whether she goes or not, I'm not sure if there's much impact for the market. But I'll tell you this, most of my contacts in D.C. now believe that we're not going to have a massive pullback on the China tariffs. There's a sense that we will have some targeted and narrow um, relaxation of certain tariffs with a real focus on the consumer side. But beyond that, we're not going to have the sweeping pullback on the tariffs that some had hoped. There was some chatter not that long ago that we would relax all of the tariffs on Chinese goods. That's just not happening. I think as we see geopolitical tensions um, continue to mount with China over Taiwan and over other issues, um, the most that we're going to see are these targeted, narrow set of tariff relaxations focused on consumer goods and other inputs. Which raises a question, Isaac, of how this administration is going to continue putting pressure on bringing inflation down, aside from just pointing the finger at the Fed. And they do talk about the recent uh, legislation that they're lining up that Joe Manchin did get on board with. Do you think that that actually could, in the near term, do anything to reduce inflation? Simple answer is no. Uh, I don't think that this bill, even though it's called the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, is really going to do all that much for inflation. There's definitely some components of it that we can point to that are going to have an impact over time, right? The, the drug pricing dynamics can have an impact, but a lot of that is backloaded into uh, a longer period. I think that the minimum tax can have some impact over time, but again, that's limited, right? It's only companies over a billion dollars in income. Um, so there are definitely certain elements that we're going to see Democrats point to and say, look, we're actually trying to tackle inflation. But in reality, it's going to have a marginal impact at most. Well, and that's if it gets over the finish line. Where do you put the odds of Kirsten Sinema giving it a thumbs up and it actually becoming a reality? So there are three S's that we're all trying to figure out, right? It's cinema, it's the salt crew, and it's sickness, right? Let's just run through each one of them quickly. Sickness, we don't know which senator is going to get COVID next, right? And that's something that matters when you need literally every single vote to get it through. On the SALT crew, we've got to watch Senator Menendez and Congressman Gottheimer, both from New Jersey, to see if they're going to blow up this whole deal over the fact that the SALT cap has not been lifted or eliminated in this proposal. And then it's all eyes on Senator Sinema. And at the moment, I think that she's going to be a yes. Most of my contacts believe that she will get to yes, and that it's exceedingly difficult to see her blowing up this deal over things like the carried interest treatment, which is something that has mattered to her in the past. And so I'm telling clients that we have to now expect this bill to become law. Um, I, I think the odds are, are a little bit better than three and four that, that this bill becomes law by the end of the year. Cinema salt sickness. I'm not sure it's got a ring to it, but I'll <laughs> go with it. Can I throw in an extra S? Secrecy. Isaac, we didn't know about this. I found that pretty interesting. I just wonder what else we don't know. How did they get this one through? Schumer, Manchin, without anybody knowing down in Washington, D.C., that this was going on? John, I've taken great comfort in the fact that no one in D.C. can keep a secret. That has given me uh, comfort on numerous issues. And so it's a little bit scary that two U.S. senators were actually able to keep a secret for this long. And my view on this is that it's, it's pretty extraordinary in these times in general. But we've got to now think about the next iterative dynamic. And to me, that's going to be political retribution from Republicans. And, you know, we've got to go back and realize that the same day that they passed the Chips Plus bill out of the Senate, Manchin announced this deal with Schumer. And Republicans feel as though they were hoodwinked because they passed Chips Plus through the Senate on an understanding that we would not have a reconciliation bill. And so there's going to be some degree of political retribution from Republicans over the next few months, which could make funding the government a little bit more difficult. It could make getting an end of year tax agreement for extenders and retirement changes a little bit more difficult. We're gonna have to wait to see, but that's what I'm hearing so far from Republicans. What's retribution look like when the game's almost up? Midterms are just around the corner, right? So isn't that why they made this play at this time? 
Exactly right. And so, look, we, I think, can have some degree of comfort in the fact that the midterms are largely baked, at least for the House. Highly likely that the House is going to flip. The Senate will wait and see. And I do think that Republicans probably have some good attack points that are going to come from this mansion deal, saying that you're raising taxes in a time of, of economic slowdown. So I think that the Senate dynamics are perhaps a little bit more in play. My two cents on this is that the lame duck session is where things go to get done. That's usually where we see big bills and small provisions all come together and, and uh, pass because no one wants to be in D.C. during that period. Right? They smell the jet fumes and want to get out of town. And so my point here is that some of the things that Congress has waited for um, until the lame duck can get more complicated now that there is this dynamic of political retribution. Isaac, awesome to catch up. Isaac Boltanski there of BTIG. Lisa, Senator Manchin, is he ever liked? He's always disliked by someone. <laughs> well, now he's... Uh, uh, the Democrats like him now. Now the Republicans don't like him. The Democrats like him. The Republicans are really angry with him because he gave a nod that he wasn't going to sign on to any plan that raised taxes. And then within 24 hours after that assurance allowed the chip bill to get passed, uh, they came out with his approval on this additional bill that was much bigger than expected and broader and included tax uh, minimum tax requirements for corporations. How much, though, is this really going to be a longstanding pivot? It just raises a lot of questions about retribution, about the climate, about what's actually getting done. I like how he signed onto it, basically because it was just called the Inflation Reduction Plan not and not the Energy Climate on. No. Plan. You don't, think the, you don't no. think the branding helped? You don't think the branding helped? You think, that the, you think that people are buying that branding? I think the branding helped. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why call it that? Well, yeah, the energy sure. climate. I don't think it was Manchin's Plan. idea. We can debate this. We, I, I'm not interested in debating it. I just, you know, know just, really are you interested in, you want to debate it? Really I, I don't want to debate about it. <laughs> just interesting. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>There's just too much inflation in the pipeline for them really to relent yet. The Fed has toggled things down. That's when the equity markets can start holding gains. Our concerns still leave us with more of a bearish tilt. You have an inflation situation that, at least in our view, looks more persistent, looks more problematic. Every major primary data point is pointing downwards right now. There's not a lot of places you can look for for optimism. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. This market is optimistic about something. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together with Katie Lyons, TK back on Monday. Futures, Bramo, up another six-tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up by 1%. The data, 30 minutes away. So I know that you don't like bad news is good news, and I'm going to throw in another one. How about Goldilocks? How much are we oh. starting to hear about a new Goldilocks of sorts, uh, where basically you do see a slowing in growth, but it's going to be not that severe and you're going to see it allowing the Fed to not hike too much and we go back into a zone where people can start being optimistic. You're hearing all of these reasons being thrown out for a rally that has been dramatic, the biggest for this month going back to November 2020. Did Goldilocks like her breakfast at 200 degrees? It's 9% <laughs> inflation. Can you really call that Goldilocks? Well, I like that. I'm just wrapping my head around the metaphor here. That's been the issue. Can you, can you even get there if you don't get inflation back down to a 3%, 2% kind of figure? And how can we possibly do that with rent where it is, with the, with the cost of goods going up, with the projections for oil, given that we are at 9.1% for the headline CPI? At more than 10% off the lows of June on the NASDAQ. Is that what this Fed wants to see? the loosening of financial conditions we've seen over the last month. Bramo, the Fed speak for me perhaps more important than the data because I'm not sure how we're meant to interpret yesterday's GDP print and I guess they're going to tell us. I would agree with that. I think Bill Dudley said something so fascinating that we really have to keep reiterating, which is if the, if the market rallies 5 to 10%, that is going to undo a lot of the tightening that the Fed is trying to accomplish, and they are going to push back. They are going to cap some of these gains, not because they're targeting the S&P, but because that is going to be the transmission mechanism. And how much is that going to be what we hear from them saying, this is not going to work, guys. In order for us to get to that cooling off, you guys have to cool it. 
I'll give you a move of 11%, 11% on Amazon in the pre-market. Katie, these tech stocks are flying. Yeah, and it goes to show you how low the bar was this earnings season. We just thought it was going to be a lot worse. It's not that these results were absolutely stellar. They just managed to eke by expectations. The consumer, it seems, is holding in there, though. Of course, Amazon has the luxury of AWS and even an advertising business that seems to be holding up in a way for them that it's not necessarily for some of those social media companies. And for Apple, they face a lot of macro headwinds. Tim Cook talked about that after these earnings. They just were able to work their way through them enough that they came in essentially in line just a little bit above market expectations. What does the picture look like going forward, though? We didn't get any firm guidance. It's the R word. It's not recession. It's resilience. Mm -hmm. Kelly, when you look at Apple, you look at Microsoft, I think that was a word that was used multiple times. Yeah, it was. Because again, we knew that the challenges were out there. They were able to work their way through them. But as we talk about a deteriorating and actively deteriorating macroeconomic environment, this is a picture that isn't going to get easier. It's going to get more difficult. So these companies are going to have to continue to navigate through those challenges. How long are they going to be able to do so successfully? Lisa, big thing from the big tech players, they're pulling back on hiring intentions. Big question for us off the back of the economic data recently is whether this weakness does bleed into the labor market, whether we start to see that slowdown confirmed in that pocket, that huge pocket of this economy. What happens with the consumer? Tell me what's going to happen with this labor market through the next couple of quarters. And how much are we already seeing that with claims ticking just a little bit higher? And anecdotally, you're hearing about companies not only just cutting back and hiring plans, but also cutting workers. How much is that the anomaly? And how much does that become the theme? We've got some data for you in about 26 minutes going into it. Futures are positive by 7 tenths of 1% on the S&P on the NASDAQ 100 this morning. Good morning to you all. The rally continues at 1%. Yield tire by three basis points on a 10 year, 270, 84 on a 10 year this morning. The euro, rocking a hard place, rocking a hard place. How many times have we talked about this? Euro dollar positive just about by a tenth of 1%, 102.05. Lisa, that data out of Europe. Could it get much worse for Germany? No. Stagnating growth, CPIs flying, headlines at a record high across the continent. Not good. Especially because there's not a great sign that there, anything is going to get much better, especially with the gas uh, picture. And a lot of people, how many notes have you read where they say that is the story heading into year end, not only for Europe, but globally, is what happens with natural gas and what yeah. happens if Russia does withdraw all exports of their supplies to Germany. And I've heard people say the GDP beats elsewhere in the Eurozone this morning. Just leave the door open for this ECB to keep on hiking. Let's have the conversation with Beata Kerr, co-head of investment strategies at Bernstein Private Wealth Management. Beata, I want to start here. Is it a bear market rally or something more durable? And how on earth do you know? It's a tough market. It's a tough market for allocators and individual investors. Obviously, when through June 30th, equity markets were down 20%, and you had core high-quality intermediate duration bonds down somewhere between 6 and 10 I think we have to remain forward-looking. We have to remember that the market already priced in a lot of damage. And I think that's what keeps individual investors going, really thinking about what does the equity market look like from here? And your comments around the earnings picture are particularly relevant this week. You talked about how the consumer could be holding up a little bit better than expected. Not all goods have price increases. And perhaps the consumer came in with a balance sheet that was actually the strongest balance sheet that they've had in a very long time. And I think we take some comfort in that. Although, of course, we see a slowing. We see a slowing in the economic picture, and we see a really tough environment for Chair Powell to manage. Beata, you said that a lot of bad news has been priced in, and that was something that we heard from Fed Chair Powell and from others who talked about how you know any rally isn't exactly setting stocks back to the high point. I'm looking at the S&P down now, only 13%, and with today's gains will be even less. I'm looking at a NASDAQ also retracing a lot of the losses from earlier in the year. How much are we looking at a recession being baked in? How much are we looking at Fed tightening being baked in that's getting unwound now because people think that the Fed's going to have to back away? Well, we think about the opportunity on a company basis more than on an index basis. And I think this is a great opportunity for stock selection because you see opportunities in companies that are managing their margins and others are having great success with the supply chain while others are challenged. You see a very mixed picture in the retail sector in particular. So, look, I think on average in recessions, earnings have dropped you know, around 20 percent. Right now, the market has not priced in that type of earnings drop. But the market has priced in a drop. Remember, we've had a big rally from a very sharp decline, and we're starting to see earnings declines in terms of forecasts. 
But valuations will reset as well. And in many ways, we see peak fear as an opportunity to buy. Because when you look at history, 12 months forward, 24 months forward, and of course, decades forward, you're better off staying put in mm -hmm. equities than really trying to manage tactically in and out. OK, so while we're looking forward, where is the leadership going to come from? Because in the month of July, you once again have growth far and away outpacing value, which is a very different story than we had at the beginning of this year. I mean, is it time for that rotation to rotate back? Uh, we don't think so. We try not to time the styles too much because, again, tactically speaking, it's hard to do. It's a very company-specific story. But generally, in this type of choppy environment where you have more volatility and earnings growth is contracting and economic growth is contracting, we see more opportunity in quality growth. It's what kind of growth do you have. It's the unprofitable tech companies that have sold off the most. But quality growth companies have also really taken a hit. And they're not seeing that same hit on their balance sheets and on their earnings power. So you have to be selective. Those names have a massive weighting on the NASDAQ 100. Can I just do that passively through that index? Uh, look, you're going to get exposure, obviously, to the overall market opportunity. But we think the time is now for stock selection. I think you have to be very careful in this environment. So there's more opportunity for differentiation. Although it's been a tough year for active managers. So again, that pivot of styles and factors has been difficult to navigate. It just comes down to the company opportunity. Beatica, well said, of Bernstein Private Wealth Management. Lisa, it's easy to say this is a stock picker's environment. It's much harder to pick the right stocks. <laughs> This week, Walmart versus, say, Amazon, one example we talked about uh, that earlier this morning, Alphabet versus Facebook, another example. How about where the leadership is going to come from? Everyone was going to say that if you got that pivot, you were going to get that rally from the big tech stocks, and you got that kind of, but not entirely, and it wasn't exactly easy. And then there are people who are saying, fade the energy bet, because that's already gone really far, and it keeps giving way uh, to more gains. So how do you get this right at a time when you have an uncertain Fed, uncertain data, uncertain backdrop for corporate spending. Tough one. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research was on with me yesterday, and he really pushed back against this idea that we could go back to the old playbook of 2019, the pre-2020 playbook, this idea that we're just going back there. Low growth, inflation comes down, the Fed has to back away by tech. He does not believe that's going to be the case. He thinks this inflation story is going to be much, much stickier than some people appreciate. Which is the reason why I've been really questioning what markets are baking in, which is potential for rate cuts at the beginning of next year. That was actually priced into the market at one point yesterday. We're talking about a much softer pace of rate hikes. How can we do that? I just am trying to wrap my head around what's going to justify that from the Fed. Some people have pushed back and actually written into me and said, you're totally off the mark. And the Fed is going to actually uh, pivot and they're going to stop uh, raising rates. They they're going to cut. And they said, you're underestimating the weakness in the economy. So it's one or the other. If the economy is so weak, why are stocks doing so well? And if the economy is so strong, why wouldn't the Fed keep raising rates? Well, the Fed keeps pointing to underlying strength of the labor market. So <laughs> maybe the labor market is the new data point to watch. I've made this point a couple of times this morning. It's not controversial at all to say that it's all about the Fed speak now because the Fed has been as clear as mud about its reaction function. So you can sit here and say they're data dependent. But if you don't spell out how they're dependent on the data, that's problematic. And Lisa, we're going to get whipsawed from Fed speech to Fed speech to data point to data point over the next six weeks. Tom's going to love this. But Tom's going to appreciate every single minute of it. Absolutely love this. Be like, oh, I don't like the Fed. ECI today, game. you've got CPI August 10th. Yeah. You've CPI. got CPI September 13th. You've got two labor market reports. You've got you, Mitch. All of a sudden, it's about you, Mitch. You've got the ISM. <laughs> next week as well. I mean, take your pick. Yeah, There's tons of it. Which of the Fed members do we actually listen to? There's another problem. <laughs> and if Chairman Powell hasn't made a call, apparently he's going to put out a newspaper article. Unsourced. <laughs> like, I mean, the, the unsourced really thing, it drives me insane. That John drives has me a insane. lot of feelings. I, I know. I, I, we're very sensitive he's people. Sensitive. <laughs> okay? Except for me. We're I'm just six angry. tenths on the S&P. This is the market you've got, and this is what's happening. We're rallying hard. On the bad news is good news dynamic, according to Jonathan Golubic, Credit Suisse, and so many others too. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word news, I'm Leanne Gerrans. ExxonMobil has posted its best profit ever thanks to surging commodity prices and rising demand. Second quarter net income at North America's biggest oil producer rose $17.9 billion, beating the previous mark set in 2008. Chevron also posted the best quarterly performance in its history. The country pledged to boost stock buybacks by as much as $5 billion.
Now, President Joe Biden and his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, have told aides to plan an in-person meeting. That is according to a U.S. official. The two spoke on the phone for more than two hours yesterday. The call centered on Taiwan, a long-time flashpoint. Matters could get worse if House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visits the island on a trip to Asia that begins today. Beijing is warning of a firm response if that does happen. China is looking at a new way of resolving those mortgage boycotts that have broken out across the country. Bloomberg has learned the government is considering seizing undeveloped land from real estate companies and using it to help finance the completion of stalled housing projects. Home buyers are holding back mortgage payments because developers have failed to finish building their houses. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Earnings season is here. Buzzwords this earnings season, recession, inflation, foreign exchange, layoffs. We are starting to see, will the world get a little bit more cautious about what these earnings are going to look like? Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Second quarter earnings at Delta Airlines missed expectations. When that inflation print hit, my eyes were on Amazon in particular. With exclusive expert analysis. The issue here really is elevated cost. If you take a look at the projections, that is a story. Bloomberg Television and Radio, the fastest numbers and analysis you trust. In this earnings season, we heard a lot of talk of recession, but we haven't seen any indication in the results. Right? We are, we're not seeing broad-based um, layoffs. There's maybe slowing of hiring, um, and and consumers are still resilient, even though we heard that you know low-income households may be seeing some pressures. That was Salita Marcelli there of UBS from New York City this morning. Good morning. We are 12 minutes away from economic data in America. Going into it, the rally continues at five or six tenths of 1% on the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq 100, up eight tenths of 1%. It would be unfair to keep calling this a bad news is good news story and base this whole rally on a Fed backing away because of a soft GDP. The earnings from some of the big players have beaten some low bars, and that includes Amazon, up by more than 11% in the pre-market. And if you want some bad news, some good news, I'll show you some bad news, and then I'll show you some good news. Intel and Apple, here's some bad news. Intel, down 11.4%. Here's some better news. Apple, up by 2.5%. And here's a man with some things to say about that difference. Pierre Farago joins us now, the global team head of technology infrastructure at New Street Research. Pierre, what does it tell you that Intel is down that hard and Apple's doing okay? Yeah, it's very, very surprising. And I think it's a fairly rich, um, rich setup. So Apple is down uh, very significantly, mostly because of the, the consumer market, the PC consumer market. Um, their revenues there are down 25%. And so what you see here is a weakening in consumer demand that affects PC manufacturers who lower their inventories. So they kind of stop ordering from Intel. So that's the old uh, playbook. We enter into a recession, we have a weakening in consumer demand and Intel gets hurt. When you look at Apple, the situation is very different. I think you have one very significant macro aspect to that, which is that Apple is exposed to affluent consumers. And I do think that today in the market, you see the consumer weakness very concentrated in the lower end of the market. You see that in smartphones, you see that in PCs, Apple is doing great with their MacBook. Uh, and, and, and you see that, of course, uh, with the iPhone versus the rest of the, the, rest of the smartphone market. So, so that's uh, one aspect um, to it. And that's another aspect to it is like execution, managing the, uh, the business, Intel built over, uh, like the excess inventory is built in the, in, the, in the distribution chain of Intel. It didn't happen uh, at Apple. Uh, that's, that's very significant as well. And then you have an element, I think, here of the, of the strength of the franchise of Apple. It is very impressive to hear them again talking about record switches. So people who buy, who switch to an iPhone for the first time, record switches in the quarter, record user base for every product. So they are still growing the number of people using Apple products. Uh, we know they've gained share in, uh, in China. Yeah. We know they're doing 
uh, well in India. So Apple is still, a, as a franchise, as a consumer franchise, also making very good progress. Pierre, at what point do you see the weakness in uh, the lower income sectors that are being represented in some of the earnings forecasts of Walmart and others? At what point does that broaden out to the more affluent customer to affect the likes of Apple, which seems increasingly like a consumer staple when you consider people's devotion to their smartphones? Lisa, you, you, you're asking exactly the, the question that keeps me awake at night. Because to be honest, in previous downturns, we've seen that game playing out relatively, relatively rapidly. So of course, we've always seen like a consumer of demand weakness being like uh, uh, stronger with more contrast in the low end of the market than the higher end of the market. But we've always seen things moving together. This is not the case today. And so my honest answer is I don't know. Um, from a stock perspective, I'm like very neutral on, on, uh, on Apple because on one hand, I see the value of the franchise, the value of the, of the business, it's a very, very strong execution. On the other hand, I'm getting worried that at some point, when the recession unfolds, at some point, uh, affluent consumers are going to start feeling the pain as well, and there might be a pullback. But this is new territory. So the fact that they've been holding us so long already is completely new. Well, and I noticed that Tim Cook talked about supply constraints as well and how that may actually be masking any kind of beginning of a deterioration in demand. How do you think about that, Pierre? So, as, as I was saying, Kaylee, no, um, uh, no strong conviction on how it plays out in terms of demand. But what you know today is that before Apple gets hurt by a weakening in demand, they still need to match demand. They've said on every product line, they are not shipping to demand. They are shipping less than the demand they see. And so that puts them in a much better situation than Intel, who basically saw a slowdown in consumer demand in an area, the PC market, where clients and distributors had elevated inventories. So the one thing I can tell you is that the day consumer demand eventually hits Apple, so the more affluent consumer stops, uh, uh, slows down its um, uh, spending, the pain on Apple is going to be far less than the pain it has been on, uh, on, on Intel in the last uh, few weeks. Pierre, wonderful to get your thoughts on things. As always, Pierre Farago there of New Street Research. Bramo, it's just one of those stories that if Tom was here, you'd know what he'd say. <laughs> People always talk this company down and here we are, here we go again. I can, do you want to play Tom for a minute? I'll take a miss. <laughs> can, I, can I pass on that? Companies, companies adjust, right? They've got free cash flow. They'll adjust, and we're data dependent, and we have some data in about six minutes' time, Lisa. And let's focus on that, because that is the employment cost index that a lot of people think could be a massive trigger for markets one way or the other. I'm not just saying that it's going to necessarily send them down. They could also send them up further if it comes in weaker than expected. A happy downside surprise, at least from the Federal Reserve's perspective, if you don't see an acceleration, a wage spiral, as Bill Ackman is calling. The, the uh, Fed speak pushback start this morning. I had someone message me a minute ago about this. Yeah. We've mentioned the conversation that Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic had with the NPR, National Public Radio, here in the United States. I don't think this country is in a recession. Because of that, we really need to address the high levels of inflation and get this economy back into a more stable and sustainable situation. Two quotes from that interview. You're going to have to expect that and even more aggressively down the line because there's no way that Fed officials can look at the market reaction and think, this is great. People are pricing in weaker economic growth. They're expecting us not to do as much, and so they're going into equities. That's not what yeah. they want to be seeing, and going into bonds for that matter. It's an easing in financial conditions. Here's a 75 basis point rate hike and the market's pricing in rate cuts. Yeah, yeah that's problematic. Futures right now up six tenths of 1%, getting you set up for that data, which is about four and a half minutes away. Mike McKee in the studio ready to go. He'll break down those numbers for you. Those numbers are just around the corner. Equities positive, up nine-tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. We fade just a little bit as we get closer towards the market open this morning. Lisa mentioned yields. Yields are up this morning by three basis points on a 10-year, 270.84. We've had some data out of Europe this morning. Record high inflation, GDP OK elsewhere, not in Germany. Germany stagnating, Euro dollar 101, 97. Your economic data in America up next.
Economic data in America, five seconds away. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning with Kelly Lyons, Lisa Brown, with Sam Jonathan Ferro. TK back with us on Monday. Going into this day, our equity futures positive five or six tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're up by seven tenths of one percent. With your data, here's Mike McKee. Well, John, we're looking at an employment cost index that comes down just a little bit to 1.3 percent from 1.4 percent, which had been a record high in the first quarter. And now we're looking at uh, the second quarter numbers, 1.3 percent. That's uh, better news uh, for the wages and salaries. It was a 5.3 percent increase for the 12 month period ending in June and 3.2 uh, percent for the 12 month period ending in June. June of 2021. So uh, it, it has gone up significantly, the wage part. Now, is that mean we have a wage price spiral? Uh, maybe not, but it isn't uh, good news for the Fed, not that they expected it to go down a whole lot. Personal income up six tenths of a percent during the month. Uh, we'll look at the breakdown there. That's the same as the prior month. So we're still making money and we'll see if it's really wages and salaries. That uh, becomes the real question. Spending up 1.1% during the month, that is about what was expected, but significantly better than we saw in May, which was a three-tenths gain. So uh, doubled, uh, more than doubled that in terms of personal spending. Now, you have to take out inflation from that. <laughs> real personal spending is nothing to write home about, up only a tenth of a percent, but that follows a three-tenths decline the month before. And then the numbers everybody's been waiting for. Notice how I Save this for last so you keep listening. Uh, PCE, inflation, up 1% during the month of June. That is higher than the six-tenths we saw before. Puts the year-over-year -year number at 6.8%, which is higher than the 6.3% uh, in May. It matches what was estimated. The core, up six-tenths during the month, and the core on a year-over-year -year basis, up 4.8%. So the number's not going in the direction the Fed would necessarily like to see. However, the one caveat would be uh, June data. We saw the energy prices start to fall uh, in July. So this month could see an improvement, but we're going to have to wait a month to get that. Mike, let's push this through this market. Future's still positive, up a half of 1% on the S&P. The Nasdaq fades just a little bit, just a little bit. Still up on the day by about 7 tenths of 1%. The move in bonds more obvious. Yields kick higher off the back of this by four basis points on a 10-year, on a two-year, up by around about seven basis points. Bramo, what do you make of this one as we work our way through this data? It's hotter than expected. This gives the Fed every reason to keep hiking rates. You're seeing that borne out in the two-year yield. The fact that you're not seeing it borne out more in the equity market is interesting to me because it seems like bad news is good news, good news is good news. They just want to rally. Uh, but it does seem interesting to me that you are seeing that employment cost index come in ahead of expectations. Yeah, it ticked down a little bit, but people are still spending and they are earning more. They're getting wage increases. This is not a scenario that's going to cause the Fed to back away from their rate hikes. This market's waiting for you, Mitch. Consumer <laughs> inflation expectations, Mike McKee. You're going to break that down for us a little bit later this morning. Yeah, the question is, do, do people think that inflation is going to continue to rise? And the latest numbers that we've seen have suggested that people have backed off of that. And that's probably related to the fact that they go to the gas station and they're paying uh, 68, 70 cents less than they were, which has got to make them feel better than they, they had before. Mike McKee, thank you. Kelly, what's your take on things? Inflation is still hot, and so it becomes a question of do we believe that the Fed is going to stay firm in its resolve to fight those price pressures instead of reacting to weak data? The equity market telling you in the last couple of days there will be weakness in their resolve. Will there, though? Is this a Volcker-esque Powell or not? Joining us now to try and answer some of that is Vince Reinhardt, chief economist at Dreyfus & Mellon. Vince, let's start here. This market believes we're seeing the first steps potentially towards a Fed pivot. Do you agree? Uh, not particularly. Uh, central to this is the view that there'll be this immaculate disinflation. Yes, the news might have been, been a touch worse than expected this morning, but we believe the Fed inflation will have over the next year and that will allow them to pivot. Inflation just doesn't come down that way. So, Vince, which is it? Is the economy doing really well uh, or is it not? In other words, I'm trying to parse out the equity move. Some people are accusing me of just being bearish no matter what, which maybe you can, you know, accuse me of whatever you want. But if the economy is weakening, we have a Fed that is willing to potentially curtail that. If they continue with their rate hikes, do you think that they are going to cause a recession by design, as Jay Powell seemed to be sort of not suggesting, but hinting that there was a risk? 
Uh, if you believe, Jay Powell, that inflation is the, the number one concern of the Federal Reserve now, they've elevated that in the dual mandate. Uh, they, he woke up this morning, inflation is a problem. Inflation is still a problem. Uh, therefore, he's got a slow aggregate demand and hope that aggregate supply fills in. The way you slow aggregate demand is tighten financial conditions. Uh, we don't have slow enough aggregate demand yet. It doesn't seem to be slowing enough in train. And we got mixed evidence that aggregate supply is filling in. So he needs tighter financial conditions. What data is the uh, Federal Reserve going to be looking at in their data dependency? Uh, I think the answer is always all of it. Uh, that in particular, he, he brought back his stars uh, in his press conference over on Wednesday, uh, i.e. the Fed look has basically uh, set central guide posts, but they are only estimated, they're approximated. And a big one is inflation and inflation expectations. That's why you and your viewers should be looking forward to the University of Michigan survey. Uh, that's why uh, they care about what's happening in bond markets right now, because that tells them what inflation compensation is. Uh, right now, inflation's job number one. So everything that goes into the space to predict inflation is what's important. Commodity prices, inflation expectations, exchange value of the dollar. Where do you think inflation realistically can get down to by the end of the year, Vince? What's the figure? Uh, not as much as the Fed hopes and much less in, in 2023. Uh, I think that uh, we'll get a, a modest uptick in the unemployment rate. Demand really is going to be slowing and inflation is going to be off a, uh, off a percentage point and a half or even two. Talking about the uh, PCE index. So we're in, in, in the high fives. The Fed is forecast is not outlandish for 2022, it's going to be more persistent next year because we have so much inertia. We saw it this morning with, with that, uh, the ECI. Uh, the ECI wasn't as much looking forward to future inflation. It was trying to catch up to past erosion to, to purchasing power. Okay, so given all of that, stickier, higher inflation than the Fed realistically wants it to be, that would indicate that the Fed is not going to be able to blink even if the data deteriorates. And yet that is fully what this market expects. And Vince, you said yeah. a moment ago they need financial conditions to tighten. That's not what they've gotten in recent days. How aggressive do you expect the pushback to be over the coming weeks? I think they're going to have to push back. I, I, to be honest, I was a little disappointed in Chair Powell on Wednesday. He was... He seemed to be accepting of where markets were right then, right, right then and there. Uh, he said, essentially, the summary of economic projections it, uh, is still appropriate, both in terms of their forecast for the policy rate and uh, the macro outcomes. Too optimistic on inflation. Essentially, right now, markets believe the ends to what the Fed wants, lower inflation. They don't quite have it right about what the means will be. The means will be tighter financial conditions. Uh, if you tightened 75 basis points and financial conditions are easier, something went wrong and you're going to have to push back. Vincent, just quickly here, from your perspective, how much would inflation have to come down for the Fed to truly pivot? Uh, I think at that point uh, is, is going to be important about the other part of the dual mandate. Where is the unemployment rate? If inflation has come down a lot, it probably means the unemployment rate is, is going up. As inflation gets closer to their goal, they can put more weight to their other goal, maximum employment. Unemployment rate starts rising. They will pivot. In our forecast, we think the, pit, the Fed declares victory a little earlier. Remember, Paul Volcker did, too. Uh, if inflation is notably lower in 2023, i.e. still in the threes, but maybe not at goal, uh, the Fed will connect dots that says it was lower now than it was six months ago, than six months before that. We're headed in the right direction. Now's the time to worry about activity. However, you don't get the slowing of activity. You don't get that decline in inflation unless you get tighter financial conditions now.
Vince Reinhardt, Dreyfus and Madam Vince, a clinic from you as always. Thank you, sir. Looking ahead to University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey data in about an hour and 20 minutes. Mike McKee's going to break that down. Mike, you were in the news conference with Chairman Powell. You asked about the journey. What did you make of what Vince just had to say? Well, I, I, it's interesting because you look at it two different ways, um, and Vince is a little more pessimistic about where the Fed is at this point. Uh, Powell basically admitting they don't know exactly where they are. They know where they're going and where they want to get to. But questions have been raised about uh, whether they would declare victory too early. He, he pushed back against that, Powell did. Uh, the other question is, do they have the numbers wrong? And that's going to be interesting because he said we are at uh, neutral, basically. And now uh, the question is, uh, w you know, with inflation where it is, how could 2.5% be neutral when you've got 9% yep. inflation or, in this case, 6.8% for uh, the PCE? And Bill Dudley came out pretty strongly against that, didn't he, Lisa, <laughs> after that particular <laughs> comment? He just absolutely disagreed with it, basically Flat said out. that this is not anywhere close to neutral. They've got to be a lot more realistic, and they've got to be more realistic with the markets. Maybe they believe, I mean, to Vincent, Reinhardt's point in immaculate disinflation. There still is that sort of assumption baked into some of the uh, prognostications from the Fed that it will just weaken naturally based on some of the rollover effects. We're not seeing that yet. You know what it's time for? To hear from Mohammed Al Arian. Aww. We're going to do that in the next hour on Bloomberg Wonderful. TV, get his views. Then we'll catch up with Tony Dwyer of Canaccord, Emily Rowland of John Hancock. We'll get Dan Ives of Wedbush and his opinion on the big tech players, and Brian Nick of Nuveen on this massive rally we've seen recently. Do you know what Maria Tadeo told me this morning? What? That the Spanish Prime Minister said he won't wear a tie. He's asked the same to his ministers, and this is the reason. In the heat, there's no need. We need to lower the air conditioning. No, no ties in Spain. Are you going to move to this Spain? Is, this is going to be about climate change now. If you wear a tie, <laughs> you're just you wear a tie, you're wrecking the earth. You're part done. of the problem. What if your tie is skinny though? Come on, exactly. <laughs> what if it's a very slim tie, Kaylee? The big debates. Come on, <laughs> happening at 20 minutes time on Bloomberg TV. <laughs> Get Mohammed's view from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the First Word News, I'm Leanne Gerrans. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is set to leave on a trip for Asia today. The question is whether she still plans to stop in Taiwan. Reports that she is considering a visit there have drawn harsh criticism from China, which considers Taiwan to be part of its territory. Meanwhile, Taiwan was one of the central issues discussed in a call between President Biden and China's Xi Jinping yesterday. Biden warned Xi against military action to re unify Taiwan with the mainland. Bloomberg's learned that the Chinese government asked TikTok if it could open a secret propaganda account. The goal was to target Western audiences with content that showcased the best side of China. TikTok turned down the request and said it would have violated guidelines. TikTok is owned by Beijing-based ByteDance. It's tried to distance itself from Chinese government influence. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic says the U.S. economy is, quote, a ways from interest a recession. He also told National Public Radio that the central bank had further to go in raising interest rates to get inflation under control. Bostic said that how much rates go up depends on how much the economy evolves. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Consumers, after two years of pandemic, want to indulge themselves with high quality products. People are actually, even when they're you know, counting their dollars, they want to buy the best quality. Really, today, we do not see consumers uh, trading down. On the contrary, as I tell you, they are, they are investing in quality. And cue the debate on whether the luxury goods and the higher income uh, geared goods are the ones that are going to keep selling regardless of weakness seen other places. That was Nicholas Aronimus, Chief Executive Officer of L'Oreal. This is the big question. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, Lisa Abramowitz and Kaylee Lines. How much are what we're what we seeing true strength and how much is a, a more leveraged spending by a consumer borrowing more with credit cards used to dealing with uh, inflation over the past couple of months and just continuing to spend anyway. Bloomberg's Critty Gripta has a view into that today uh, here with a chart. Critty.
Yeah, well, I want to look at personal savings as a percent of disposable income, but not just now, going all the way back to the early 2000s, because there is a parallel I really want to point out here. We're looking at about a 5.1% rate. Of course, we know that savings rate really skyrocketed with all that fiscal stimulus. It has since come down. We're now at levels that we saw really post-GFC going back to 2009, but that's not the parallel I want to make. I want to make it going back to 2004, 2005, where you saw that savings rate drop and actually hit negative territory at one point. And the reason for that was because inflation was getting higher and higher. We had a 4 to 5% inflation rate at the time, but the housing market was getting stronger and stronger, which meant Americans felt so strong about their wealth situation, the fact that their houses, their assets were priced so highly that they actually felt like they didn't really need those savings. They could spend a little bit more. Now, we're not quite there yet, Lisa, but I wonder if that's where we're headed, just given where the housing market is, given where wages are, and how much the wealth effect really plays into consumer spending here. Interesting, Kriti. And then add the complication of the recent weakening that we've seen and how that might muddy some of the waters that are already incredibly, incredibly muddy. Kriti Gupta, thank you so much. We are parsing through the data this morning. We just got that employment cost index that came in above expectations, although uh, coming down just a bit. Personal spending beat expectations, not blockbuster, especially not on an inflation-adjusted basis. But we're seeing this at least in a very bifurcated way, depending on the retailer. And Arun Sundaram is trying to make sense of which retailers are going to benefit the most. We saw Amazon be resilient. We saw Walmart really struggling. Target as well. He's senior equity research analyst at CFRA. How much is what we're seeing a bifurcation of the haves and the have-nots that the retailers that cater to the higher-end individuals will continue to do well while the others struggle with margin compression? Yeah, I mean that, that, that's exactly it. You know, we we are you know we are seeing this big bifurcation between the middle-income, upper-income consumer and the lower-income consumer, which is why retailers like Walmart and Target are struggling a little bit more than retailers like an Amazon and also Costco is, is tailored to maybe a little bit more of an affluent uh, demographic base. So uh, retail, it's not, it's not even there. There are, there are differences in retail. And so that's what we learned yesterday with, with Amazon reporting. And, and, and they noted that they're, they're not seeing similar inventory issues like the other, some of the other big box retailers are. Uh, and that was a huge concern going into the Q2 release. So that's probably one of the reasons why we're seeing the stock up uh, pretty, pretty heavily this morning. So the fact that inventory management is a critical factor here, potentially, what does that mean about how much of this is just execution and idiosyncratic to each individual company and their ability to navigate these confusing supply and demand dynamics versus a bigger macroeconomic tell? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to really dig down to the inventory issue because a lot of that is just due to cost inflation. But of course, yeah, units are up for a lot of retailers. Uh, for for a company like Target, for example, you know they their 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 floor spaces, their square footage in their stores are relatively smaller than a Walmart, you know, and then, and they don't want to crowd their store space, so they're actually renting out external storage and you know putting some of this excess inventory in the external storage, which is costing them not just money in rent but also transportation costs. But you know, obviously with with Amazon, they don't really have a brick and mortar footprint, so they have larger warehouses, so you know they're not facing those similar problems, they can keep some of that inventory there. And yeah. plus Amazon, a lot of that inventory is not is not theirs. You know, they have, they have a huge third party seller business and, and they can rely on those third parties um, into, you know, during these kind of times. And in fact, this quarter, this past quarter, third party uh, mix out of total unit sales was 57%. And that was the highest on record. So the, Amazon is relying a lot more on their third parties these days. But on the subject of costs, obviously Amazon also has admitted they overhired and overextended, overbuilt during the pandemic when it comes to some of that warehouse footprint and the labor force. They're now trying to roll that back. How effective do you think they will be on some of those cost control measures? Because that has a huge implication for margins going forward. Yeah, it does. And that was really the story over the past year or so. It was really cost inflation due to wages, transportation, um, but now we're starting to see the cost pressures start to ease. You know, if, if you look at Q1, their, their incremental costs were, I think, $6 billion. Q2, which they just reported, incremental costs were $4 billion. And, and the big difference there is that worker productivity improved. You know, they doubled their workforce over the past two years. And, and with the new workforce comes a lot of you know, producti productivity issues. And they're starting to work through that. Uh, and then what they're also trying to do is starting to work through some of the other cost pressures, like higher transportation costs. You know, they started to charge a, um, a, a surcharge to some of their third parties that are utilizing Amazon's fulfillment services. And that's helping so alleviate some of those cost pressures. And going into the second half of this year, you know, the, the cost outlook does look a little bit better for, for, for Amazon. You know, they are gonna be lapping some of the elevated supply chain costs, wage pressures from last year. 
you know, the worker productivity should continue to improve. And another big uh, topic point is, is about their overcapacity and, and fixed cost deleveraging. Uh, you, you made that point. Yeah, they are starting to sublease some of their excess warehouses, things like that. And so they're really trying to grow into that capacity right now. So they're trying to reduce capacity and grow their sales and hopefully that those two match. Uh, but that, that, that last part might take some time, like, you know, a year or two, just because the dem demand environment is obviously normalizing over the past two years. Arun Sundaram, thank you so much for being with us, Senior Equity Research Analyst at CFRA. And this is the issue, Kaylee. I mean, we've seen resilience, that R word that John was talking about from some of these companies, but they have uh, perhaps the ones that don't have the inventories, that don't necessarily have the different kinds of product mixes that a Walmart does, where they see more purchases on the food side, where it's harder to pass along all of the price increases. How much is this the beginning and how much is this the middle? And, and that's really what I'm really keep thinking about is where are we in this cycle? What do these earnings mean as for the weakness that we see on the edges? Especially when you have these executives talking about the macro headwinds that are still out there, that they're still facing. And yes, they had success in navigating through them last quarter, but as things f deteriorate further, how much are they going to have success in doing so? And I, I just look at the move we're seeing on Amazon. I mean, up more than 10% in pre-market trading for not flying over the bar, just basically stepping over it. It goes to show you just how low expectations were. And so is it just a question of a lot of negativity being priced in? Or a question of everyone being on vacation and being very little liquidity. I and mean, that's another issue that people yeah. are talking about. Uh, we are about uh, 35 minutes away from the opening bell here in New York. We did get that key data that the, uh, that the Federal Reserve has been looking at. Employment cost index came in at 1.3%, above the expected 1.2%. The PCE core deflator increased year over year, although still a little bit uh, within range. How much do we see this continuing to double down and question the narrative that's being baked into market? that the Fed will be able to back away, and you are seeing yields a little bit higher. Stocks, however, uh, not too, doing too badly. S&P futures still up uh, about a half a percent. Interesting, though, the dollar. The dollar strengthening here uh, against the euro on the heels of these economic reports. The strength really in the economy seeming to edify more rate hikes to come. Coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio, Jason Furman. Do not miss that. A former advisor to Obama. This is Bloomberg.